Good morning, Legacy viewers from Port Shepson today, where I'm going to be interviewing uh, Dr. Anthony Turton uh, from National Intelligence back in the day. Um, so we in for, I think, an exciting uh, interview. Um, so let me hand over to, to Anthony. Uh, okay, it, it's a deep privilege today for me to talk to you gentlemen your legacy program. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to represent not only myself but also to represent my colleagues uh, who are faceless and nameless uh, who served their country with uh, great dignity and integrity over a very very troubled and tumultuous period of time in National Intelligence Service particularly Chief Director of Covert Operations. So let me talk to you a little bit about COVID operations, just to give you a general overview of what it was and why it was created. I did my entire national service training uh, in the Armored Corps um, at uh, one SSB in, in School of Armour. In at that stage, uh, early 70s, there was no war going on, so I was then deployed into some other ridiculous roles somewhere, and I generally didn't have a very, very exciting national service. When Savannah happened, I volunteered for Savannah, but uh, I was told that it, uh, they, they would rather use uh, national servicemen, so um, I, nothing happened in my life. I, I continued my entire uh, uh, conscripted period as a camper. I did all my camps, I uh, literally went right away, I did almost 720 days plus some. I actually became a, became a volunteer at the end of my service uh, with, with the BV number behind my uh, my, my uh, number. But my military service generally was, uh, in, my, in my opinion anyhow, quite unremarkable. And in fact, I was quite, <clears throat> quite uh, frustrated in many ways because I knew that I could never reach my full potential in that space. I just couldn't do it, certainly not in a, in a citizen force unit, just simply not possible. So I just bided my time and uh, <clears throat> I became involved um, at, a, at a moment in my life in the, in the 1980s. Uh, I was farming uh, professionally uh, and I was uh, doing my my, my uh, final camps, finishing them off. But I got involved in National Intelligence Service at that point in time through a directorate known as 06. 06, uh, 06 oper is, is counter espionage operations. And I was approached by counter espionage operations, which is a deep, deep clandestine unit. And uh, I was uh, <coughs> involved in some of the counter espionage work, and I, I, I really felt extremely comfortable within that county espionage background. Uh, county espionage is about spy catching. It's about, it's about the identification of penetration of, 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 of intelligence services by other intelligence services. And you get offensive and you get defensive. And um, I was involved in, in, in offensive county espionage operations in a division known as 061, 061 slash 01. And this was a, uh, a, a deep penetration operations unit where we were handling members of other intelligence services in what was then the neighboring states, the TBVC states. And my role as a farmer was to develop uh, the, uh, the ability to cross borders on a regular basis and actually establish a consulting company uh, as, as my cover. And uh, I helped to establish uh, certain consulting services in some of the neighboring states and that was the, was my, the cover that I used. And uh, my role was to link up with a, uh, uh, a member of the, I won't name the service, but of the Foreign Intelligence Service that in those days everything was done with telex and um, he had access to the telexes. <clears throat> and our interest was we wanted to know which of our special forces and which of our defense force people were under surveillance by them. And we also wanted to know what support they were then giving to the ANC, SACP and Exile. So those were our key, our key interests. And my role at that point in time in 06101 was to cross the border on a regular basis, go into this foreign Iceland environment, and I had to uplift uh, what is known as a dead letter box, a DLB. And um, uh, so I never met the, uh, the agent in place. I just had to get the, uh, the documents, a pile of documents, a pile of telexes. I had to take them to a safe place, I had to photograph them. And then those, uh, that form with all the photographs in had to then be placed in a safe, safe uh, part of my uh, bucky. In those days, I used to ride a, uh, a Ford V6 bucky, 
and uh, it was very really nice for, you know, for, for riding long distances into neighboring states. And uh, <coughs> the toe hitch on the back of the bucky was hollowed out. So I would unscrew the toe hitch in a certain way and I would insert this, uh, this, uh, this full canister uh, in there and I would come across the border with this thing in full view of, of customs offices, etc. And I did that and uh, I, I found it quite, uh, quite sort of intriguing. At least I was being used in some kind of constructive way. <clears throat> then something, uh, okay, then in that, in that period of time, uh, a couple of other things were happening. And the one thing that was happening now was the build-up to, to what eventually became the Pretoria car bomb. But the build-up, the early build-up to that by MK. And uh, particularly the, 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 the bombing uh, uh, campaign. The early 80s was characterized by bombing campaigns. And I kind of, that kind of intrigued me. I, quite, I, I, I felt a sort of an affiliation for that. I felt that I could you know, get involved in that and do something with that. So I don't quite know how to have, because you can't volunteer for these things, but I was then um, brought across into or, or, or seconded to or positioned in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an operational entity at that point in time that was working on, this, uh, on, on, the, on the bombings. And I really felt that for the first time that I was actually doing something of, you know, of significance. And um, what uh, 06 had discovered at that point in time was that prior to any, everyone, uh, any one of the bombings, uh, a certain MK intelligence officer had been seen crossing the border at a certain point in time. And uh, our task was to, was to <coughs> infiltrate that uh, in, the, in the intelligence business. In the county espionage business, what you want to do is you want to penetrate your opposition service. You don't want to eliminate them. You, want, you eliminate them through, through penetrating them and through turning them and, and through using the network. So you don't go in there and put a bullet in them. That's not what elimination means. Uh, so your, 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 your primary objective is to identify, place under surveillance, map out the whole network and then infiltrate that network. And first prize is to turn the person. First prize, turn the person, use them as a double. Second prize is, 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 is now go sort of skating in on that network that you've now created. And, and that's known as, a, as, as, as an infiltration. You want to infiltrate or you want to penetrate. Penetrate, you, 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 you get hold of the guy, you turn him. That's a penetration. Infiltration, you identify what's happening and you then sort of work out how to get into it. So in this particular case, uh, we managed to identify uh, uh, the, the movement of explosives, etc. And there was a very sophisticated operation then underway within national intelligence that I later got involved in uh, uh, as well, but a very sophisticated operation. And that's, that operation was known as Operation Cruiser. And Cruiser was, in my professional opinion, probably the single most important operation that, that uh, national intelligence has ever conducted. And I would liken that operation in significance to uh, the penetration of the Enigma code, or the cracking of the Enigma code by GCHQ during World War II, when, uh, when uh, Bletchley Park could read all of the ciphers going out to the, uh, to the, uh, the German forces. And this was, this was of the same significance, but of course on a different scale. You know, we weren't involved in a global war, we were involved in our local war of liberation, but nonetheless. And through, through these different strands of operations uh, that, were, that were either infantile or, or, or already in existence or you know, ongoing at the time, I learned a lot about uh, how national intelligence operations work. And what, what happened in this particular case was we managed to identify where the caches of weapons were being kept. And that was very significant because once you know, know where, the, where the explosives are, are stored and when you now know what, uh, you don't necessarily have to know what's, what's been planned with those things because you can now get into the cache and you can now, to use an army word, you can jip over the cache. And <clears throat> I wasn't involved in that particular part of it. I was just involved in the identification of where these things were. But it was, it was quite uh, intriguing. Um, to note that after this operation of ours, when we identify these caches, we suddenly started getting news coming back in the newspaper that the bombers planting SPM mini limpet mines on railway lines, etc., were all dying as they were, as they were busy planting the bombs. Uh, so what, it, what had happened was that the fuses, MPV, MPV fuse, it's a, it's a naval 
naval uh, uh, fuse that operates on a lead bar with, with, with a spring tension and it's color coded and what happened was those color codes were changed, they were altered. So a slow acting fuse was then made a fast acting fuse, almost instantaneous. So as the, as the guys were setting explosives, uh, it went off it, basically taking out the bomber. And for the first time in my, in my life, I kind of got a sort of sense of this is something that, that we are striking back, we are making a difference now. You know, we are, we are, although obviously I had empathy for those people that were being taken out, but on the other hand, I, you know, we were in a state of war and uh, I had even more empathy for the innocent civilians that were affected in places like Magoo's Bar and, and, and you know, the St. James Church Massacre, etc. So you know, under those circumstances, it's very clear, you know, the line is drawn and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's them and us and there's no middle ground. And that's the way it is. So that was my first taste of kind of like really, really lacquer cray operations. I mean, I really, I got a sense that this is something that I could really identify with, that I could, I could flourish, I could absolutely flourish. So I loved that. I really loved that kind of work. And I, I just, for the first time, I just started feeling that, you know, I found a niche, I found my place in the world. And then I got wind of, a, of a, another special entity that was being created. And I must first explain before I go any further this notion. If you if you're following the Donald Trump saga at the moment, you'll notice that Donald Trump is is uh, in trouble for, uh, for 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 being in possession of certain intelligence documents. And the Americans use the word of SCI, secret classified intelligence, no, sorry, no, secret compartmental intelligence, SCI. So all of the work that I was involved in was SCI collected. Uh, and I just need to explain to the, to the viewer what that means because the impression is created when someone talks to me and they find out that I was with NIO, that I must know everything about everything. Furthest from the truth, okay? Uh, because of the SCI classification process, uh, we actually didn't often know what was going on to the left and to the right of you. Uh, and this is just the way that those, uh, those um, sensitive compartmented operations worked. And they were sensitive because in this case they could literally, they were matters of life and death, they were matters of national strategic importance, uh, but uh, uh, loss of life was directly involved and the potential to going to war between countries was involved. So they were all classified as top secret and in fact all of 06's work was, was absolutely as, as highly classified as you could get it. That's why you don't hear anything ever about, about 06 operations. But um, then in the early 1980s, with this bombing campaign, like a couple of interesting things happened. The one interesting thing was that we managed to get hard evidence from a county espionage perspective that foreign intelligence services were directly aiding and abetting in going to West Israel. Direct aiding and abetting. And this was, of course, uh, a red flag to the bull. And you must appreciate that, uh, that national intelligence at that point in time had become a fairly sophisticated organization. And when I say sophisticated, we were under the very able leadership of a man called Dr. Neil Barnard, who was an extremely visionary, luminary man, a man who, with whom I resonated 100%. I found in Neil Barnard the leader that I could completely support. An intellectual man, I'm somewhat of an intellectual person, uh, a, 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 a true philosopher, philosopher warrior, I'm a philosopher warrior, philosopher first, warrior second. And uh, I found that through Neil Barnard, I could really resonate with what he was doing, what he was thinking about. And under Neil Barnard's extremely capable leadership, a couple of remarkable things have been happening within national intelligence below the radar screen. And the one thing was that national intelligence had developed a formidable counter-espionage capability. And when I say formidable, I'm talking now about some absolute classic uh, operations that were run with the FBI, with MI6, with the major intelligence services of the BND, the German BND. These are major intelligence services, uh, uh, the spy catching services. And there were two uh, operations of particular significance that I can mention. One was the capture of a guy called, called Kozlov, and the other one was a guy called Loginov. Loginov, Loginov and Kozlov were two uh, Russian intelligence officers. They were illegals. And, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the world of counter-espionage operations, uh, the, the, the Russians run their operations on a very precise and very specific way. It's very well known to, uh, to let's call it the NATO forces, uh, the, the forces that, uh, that, that cooperate in those days against Russia. And the Russians have got a playbook. They, they operate to a playbook. And they are very, very um, 
rigid when it comes to the application of that playbook. And part of that rigid application uh, is that uh, every, uh, every, uh, every agent before they are deployed is given a code name. Before you deployed, you get selected. You go through a very rigorous process of selection. And before you get deployed, as, as, uh, you, you've got two choices in your deployment. So your career path goes from a T-junction, either left or right. When you get to that point, if you go left, you get deployed uh, in a foreign diplomatic embassy as, as, as a so-called legal. So you're now declared to those service, but you might not be fully declared. You might be declared as a foreign affairs guy, but you actually are a, are a KGB guy. So that's the one thing in the big sort of uh, counter, counter espionage operation there now is uh, to how do I identify these guys? Because you know that every embassy's got 10 of them. So how many, you know, you know of two of them, so where the other eight? And that, that, that's, that's the sort of name of that guy. But that didn't really interest me. That, that, that wasn't intriguing enough. The other, oper the other, other part of the, of the T-junction is that you can now become an illegal. And the illegals were the absolute elite of the elite in the, in the KGB and GRU. So an illegal is selected at a very early age in their life. And they are schooled, they are, they are hosted, they are groomed for the entire life and their career development is, play, is, 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 is developed long before they even uh, enter the field. And that's one thing about the Russians, they play a very long game. And uh, we learnt a lot from that because the, the long game that they played was they would identify their illegals and they would say that this, this illegal in the case of, 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 of Kozlov, he is going to eventually go to Canada. We're going to, we're going to put him in in Canada. But in order to get there, he's first got to go here, and he's got to go here, and he's got to go here, and you've got to build what is known as your legend, because you're using COVID documentation. So, so, the, so he will go in as a man, as, a, as an identity that didn't really exist. So, so a large portion of his life as an illegal is to develop that COVID name, to develop that uh, that, that, you know, that identity, what is known as the legend, the legend documentation, and that uh, that was a technically complex thing. But the Russians were particularly good at that, and we learned a lot from that. We, we, we are very quick learners in South Africa. So, so, so in, in the case of these two Russians that were eventually captured in South Africa, uh, or with South African involvement, um, they were on their way to final destination into America, or into Canada, or into one of the Five Eyes countries. And um, we played a significant role in capturing those. And as a result of, 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 of uh, the um, uh, national intelligence's role in capturing those really high profile, uh, 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 n n big, big, big time as far as the uh, other intelligence services started to gain a very strong respect for NIS. Mm -hmm. So NIS traded on that and they, they played a very big role in that. And in fact, there's another interesting SADF linkage to that role, and that is that when uh, a certain gentleman named Sapa van der Mest was captured, Sapper van der Mest was, was captured and there was an, uh, a, 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 a few attempts made to go and liberate him. So you speak to a lot of people, I think six one at one point in time had an attempt to go and liberate him. I know special forces had a couple of efforts to go and liberate him. They could never find Sapper van der Mest. So we always kept this van der Mest thing in the, back, in the background. And we were very low profile people, we didn't talk about what we were doing. But the, the, the day came when, when we had uh, uh, Loginov, I think I thought either Loginov or Kozlov, I, I mixed the two up, I forget now which one, but yeah, we had one of those guys, and they were now technically useless to us, we captured the guy, mm -hmm. and so what, so we've got a Russian spy now, you know, who cares about that now, we want, we want to find a mesh back, so we put the, the spy on the table, we said, we said, we reached out to, to uh, the Russians, and we said, right, we want to trade, uh, you can have your man back, we want to find a mesh back. And when, when, when that game started being played, before we did that, we liaised it with other intelligence services, other partner services, because all of these things are done in partnership with other services, and I'll explain that now how it's done. But it's done in, in partnership, and we, we, we told the other services that we were going to do this. And they said, whoa, 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 hold yours, before you do that, before you do that. we've got some spies that we also want to swap. So we want to, we propose to you, we the foreign services propose to you, national intelligence services, before you, before you put on the table that you want to mesh back for, for your man, then, uh, then we want you to link to a couple of other, other guys. So there was a venture, a very, very big diplomatic initiative played out at that point in time, which I think was an extremely important moment for national intelligence service to come of age. And I'll tell you why that, why that was, because eventually when we handed over the spy, 
I wasn't involved because well, I was a COVID member at that point in time, and COVID members were kept far, far away from, from the sort of diplomatic glare. <clears throat> but when it was handed over, the, the, the German intelligence service, the BND, said oh, they want some of their guys to be, to be released as well. And to sweeten the deal, they said that they will give us access to technology that we didn't have. And that was very, very, very important. So uh, South Africa, at, uh, at that point in time, because of sanctions, because of isolation, uh, South Africa had been developing a formidable technology base. We all know about arms called Denel and that sort of stuff. We know about the hopper radios and the G6s and all that stuff eventually. But there was a lot of stuff happening in that space. And some of it was electronics related. You know, missiles and electronics, etc. So we were quite deeply into the electronics space. But we had very uh, limited uh, technological capacity with, uh, with, uh, with satellite, satellite, uh, satellite uh, uh, stuff. And uh, through this particular service, uh, they gave us uh, a scuttle, they gave us a dish, a satellite, a satellite interception capability. And that became hugely important because from that moment onwards, we could now establish a backdoor interception into the satellite serving uh, the African footprint. And we could listen to every single telephone conversation that took place from the a African National Congress headquarters in Osaka back to Samafco in uh, 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 the Solomon Mutlangu Freedom College back in, uh, in uh, uh, East Africa. Uh, we could listen to every one of those and we could even access the, uh, the, the, the comms between uh, Lusaka and London. So we had direct comms because of SAPA Fundamesht. SAPA Fundamesht gave us direct comms into the heart of, the, of, of ANC MK operations. Thank you SAPA Fundamesht. We owe you a huge debt of gratitude. However, at the same time, there was a transfer of technology taking place. And that transfer of technology was very significant because South African engineers were very smart. This is some of the technology. This doesn't look very good now because today, you know, this is all, this is all, um, it's all micro stuff. Now. So this is some of the early technology that we made ourselves. This is a telephone interception device. This is, uh, you know, you just plug your, your lines in here and if you, you know, if you're doing various things. And we had all of this kind of, all of this kind of stuff, you know, the, uh, 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 bunk. And we started miniaturizing this, and that's a very small miniature ones here in the, in the mix here somewhere. That's a very small miniature. Okay, there's, a, there's a very small, very small. I just want to make sure. So, oh, right, yeah, so there, there, that's a very small interception device there. Yeah. Very, very small little thing there, okay. And we started getting very good at this stuff. Yeah. The Buddha, no, Buddha Michael Plum. When the Buddha makes a plan, you must know that these guys know what they're doing, okay. So, uh, so, so we started getting into this directly as a result of the Fun Mesh link. And we started manufacturing this kind of stuff, and this is all. It doesn't look very sophisticated, but nonetheless, this is you know, this is this is uh, uh, was a very very important thing. So, when the first hard drive computers came out, that was a very important moment for us because the first hard drive computers. Now, mm -hmm. our technology people <coughs> started working on those and uh, converting those into the first interception devices for, you know, for telephone conversations, etc., and for caching, caching material, etc. And that gave us a huge advantage in the continent of Africa because we started to liaise with other intelligence services in Africa, and they were then, of course, uh, um, very interested in, 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 in our, let's call it the hardware, the hardware of, of intelligence. They were interested in that, and that gave us a footprint into all of these countries. And uh, that was something that, that became very significant in some operations that I was involved in later on. Mm -hmm. So I just want to sort of state there that, you know, that um, NI was a technologically innovative place, highly, highly innovative. And we started learning from other intelligence services. We started learning very, very fast. And in that regard, I'm very, very happy uh, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to look back at my career now. Okay, so within... Within, within the Chief Directorate of COVID Operations, we had amazing leadership. Amazing leadership. I can't mention their names, but these are remarkable people. And we had one guy who, in my book I refer to him as M MK, Mike, Mike Killer, Mike Killer MK. And Mike, Mike uh, Killer MK had this vision that we need to create a unique culture. And we're creating these, these these units very rapidly and then they, we close them down very rapidly if we have to. So they, they, they lack a culture. So he created this culture of this old Anglo-Boer War thing, which maybe resonated with some, but not with whatever, but nonetheless, there was this Boer War culture of the bitter ender. 
So when we were finished our selection program and when you were qualified as an operator, you got a medal, little medallia, bitter in a medallia. And in the decade and a half that the unit existed, every year they would give out one award for the top operator for the year. So only maybe 15 of these have ever been given out. I was the recipient of the 1989 award for the penetration work behind the Iron Curtain. And this is the award here. Yeah. Yeah. This is Boer in Seirur. Yeah, yeah. And you'll see there now, it's an interesting because there it says, with the rector out to Kenneth, 1989, R.M. Cronin. That was my service name. Roger Mark Cronin. Roger Mark okay. Cronin. Interesting uh, enough, in my summing up, I was going to ask yeah, if you Roger used your Mark own Cronin. names. Or so, there. so now, is this mine or am I, am I a, a, a wannabe? You know, am yeah. I lying to you about this thing? Now? I could be a wannabe. It's not impossible. So we put that down there now. So here we go. We never ever had any, any ID ever. Never. It was complete plausible deniability. If you get caught, you're on your own. Yeah. You're on your own. So we never had any ID. And in fact, you know, we had a thing called pocket litter. You would always make sure there's no pocket litter, no, no little torn up bit of paper or something that compromises you. But then we now become the Secret Service. And the Secret Service is now controlled majority by the ANC. And they don't understand this culture. So they issue ID documents. <laughs> so there's my ID document. There's my ID document from SAS, the South African Secret Service. Oh, and yeah. then you'll see, there they have R.M. Cronin. Oh, yeah. R.M. Cronin. So that is me, and you see my photograph there. So R.M. Cronin is, is that okay? So it's not oh, okay. a wannabe there, okay? Yeah. But then, then, when I was now the staff officer, part of my work, I had to go and do liaison with other, with other entities now. Yeah. And uh, I was liaising with the police and liaising with the army and liaising with other stuff. And we, had li we liaised it, so it was a rank to rank. It was a, it was a very yeah. hierarchical thing. So I had to be identified. So there we are, I got my, my official ID document, but at this stage the admin structures were falling apart now, yeah. you see? So there was my official ID document. <laughs> and oh, there, yeah. there it was T Cronin, T. Because everyone called me Tony, but my service name was Roger Mark. Yeah. Roger Mark, but, but, they, but these guys now, they, they, the admin is falling apart. Yeah, they, yeah. they didn't know Roger when it was Tony, so he said T Cronin, yeah. okay? So that doesn't so, even go A for Anthony. Yeah, no, so, 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 so T Cronin there. But if you look at if you look at the back there, so there's my signature. <laughs> there's my okay. <laughs> there's my signature. There's your signature, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, so so I was there. I was there. Yeah. I was there, and uh, I've got some uh, some bits and pieces. I'll show you some accommodations that I got, etc. That were that were given. Uh, that would give accommodation in your COVID name and also in your real name. So I, I subsequently got this thing put on <laughs> on the back of it, <laughs> and that that that's the same thing, but but with my real name. Well, okay, yeah. Okay, so it's the same thing. So, so this thing here is a collector's item. I can tell you now. Absolutely, It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a handmade brass thing. It's, it's pro I don't want to. I don't want to sound um, sound funny, but if you look numerically, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at, if you just look at numerically, how many how many HCs have been awarded? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not really many. Uh, yeah, but that that would be in the that would be in the tens, certain the hundreds, I would think. Maybe. Maybe yeah. the hundreds. Yeah. yeah. This this maybe been. 12 to 15 maximum yeah. okay so this just from just purely from that just to show you i'm not, I'm not yeah. creating equivalents or anything okay i'm just saying that this you know that this is a, a, an exceptionary rare thing yeah. and that bit of anger medallion that i've got that would be an exceptionary rare thing exceptionally yeah. exceptionary rare thing. I, I haven't got to show you now because it's misplaced something but anyway. well, i received a problem and what that meant and in how we created some other very very interesting and very very high impact capabilities so i'm going to sort of transition now from the, from the background right so i'm going to now speak about a rapid evolutionary change that took place in national intelligence uh, service in the 1980s after these these uh, spy handovers you know, went away where, where our counter espionage uh, unit was now accepted by the other county espionage forces of the world, you know, the FBI's and the, and the MI, MI6's and GCHQ's as, you know, as, leg as being legitimate players. Uh, we could then start doing some other very interesting stuff. 
Now, you must appreciate that uh, in order to, to make decisions under conditions of extremely high uncertainty and great risk with incomplete information, often from conflicting sources who might be compromised that you don't necessarily know how to trust. This is a, this is a, a, a big challenge. It's a big challenge. And Barnard played a very big role in developing the internal processes needed to do that. And what we, what we started to do was we started to learn from other intelligence services. We are very rapid learners. That's one thing about us. Uh, and there was a, one, th one, one entity in particular that interested us a lot, and that was the Israeli Mossad. Now, of all the intelligence services in the world, the Mossad, in our opinion, was probably one of the best in terms of what we needed to replicate. And uh, part of the Mossad journey goes back to uh, World War II, before the State of Israel was created. There was a, uh, a, a fighting force in Burma known as the Chindits. And the Chindits were started by a guy called, uh, called Ward, Ward, I forget his name, I forget his first name, but a Wingat, Wingat. If you go to Israel today, you'll see there's a, there's a statue to, to Ward Wingate uh, uh, you know, in the intelligence community space. And <clears throat> we learned from his philosophy, and his philosophy was very simple. You start off by recruiting the best of the best. You start off by getting the cream of the crop. Don't start with Mickey Mouse, start with the cream of the crop. And what you particularly want to do is you want to, you want to recruit people that are competent, calm, cool, collected, with a proven track record under very hostile conditions. They must have a proven track record. So you don't want to bring out Greeny Beanie up and, you know, and, 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 and blood them that way. You want to bring someone that's already been blooded and you want to be, you want to be forge them and, you know, and, and sharpen, sharpen the edge that they have. And then you want to invest very heavily into the training of those people. You want to give them the very best that you can. And in fact, I'd like to think of it as an analogy like a fighter pilot. If you're a fighter pilot, you know, the cost of developing a really a top gun fighter pilot, you've got to really you know, start with the best and then you've got to really retrain them. And that is pretty much the kind of thing that, uh, that, 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 was, that was adopted with us. And the next thing that you've got to do is you've got to have a whole lot of, 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 of psychological batteries to, you know, to try and recruit the right people because you don't want weird people, you don't want, you don't want people that have got these delusions of grandeur, you don't want people that are, that are psychopathic or anything like that. That's very important. You can't have that because this sort of space you know, is attractive to psychopaths. So you've got to be very careful about that. So you, that's a terribly important thing. But then the other thing that we learned from the Israelis was um, controlled, focused aggression. Aggression. If you do something to Israel, they come for you with aggression. And we started adopting that controlled, focused aggression. Not just uncontrolled aggression, not just brought across the board. Controlled, focused aggression, like a magnifying glass. Just focus that aggression on that target area. And the other thing that we learned from the Israelis, which was, of course, of great significance to South Africa, was the, the overlap of technology, but also also the also the overlap with also the 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 overlap with the international diaspora go anywhere in the world and you'll find a member of the jewish community lives there and they will be loyal to israel and they will be loyal to the country that they that they're living in so that diaspora is very important and you go to anywhere in the world and you will find a south african that is that is loyal to their country still and that's so the diaspora was very important and the third thing is the fact that, that, that both South Africa and Israel felt extremely, extremely uh, uh, threatened. You know, this, this, this whole idea of, of extreme hostility for, towards us that, that gave us high level of cohesion. So we learned from that. And we, in particular, we learned from the way that Mossad created small teams, small teams operations, small teams groups. And there were two particular operations that were of great significance for, for us that, uh, that, 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 uh, that I, I, will, I will expand on later on. And the one operation was the Munich, Munich Olympic Massacre. Mm -hmm. When the Munich Massacre happened, very, very quickly, Mossad assembled a team, high impact team of people, and they started hunting, tracking down 
those, those perpetrators. And they eventually eliminated every single one of them. They took them out. They took them out. Every single one of them. And unfortunately, most of the, of the team were also injured or, or wounded or something in some way other than very extremely high, high risk operation. But they, 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 they succeeded in their mission objective. But there was another very, very significant uh, Mossad operation that we really got into. We, we studied that thing as a case study of, of great importance. And that was the, the, uh, the capture of, of uh, a man called, called Adolf Eichmann. He was living in a house in Garibaldi Street, South America, Argentina. And uh, the uh, diaspora picked him up and they placed uh, close in surveillance on him. And uh, they eventually identified that this is, in fact, Adolf Eichmann. And they decided to launch a, a controlled, focused aggression uh, operation against him. They're going to go and capture him. They're going to kidnap him. They're going to go and capture him as he walks out of his house on his way to where he's going to go to. They're going to capture him, and they're going to fly him home, and they're going to put him in front of the judge. And that operation stood out for us as, 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 as probably one of the best examples of small team operations that suited our needs. So let's park that operation now because uh, that, that becomes relevant in my life professionally later on. Go back to the early 1980s. So what was happening in the early 1980s? So the early 1980s, if you sketch the background scene, Soweto uprising happened in 1976. Lots of exiles went out, 1976-77. Uh, internal police uh, activity pretty much brought the uh, internal situation under control in the late 70s and early 80s. And it was relatively quiet, but in the 19, uh, from, from the late 70s, uh, from Savannah onwards, SADF was involved in Angola. So we had a situation where we had an internal, an internal uprising that was uh, largely being contained by the SAP riot squad. And you had the external operations that were now being very, very professionally run by SADF. So that, you had these two sort of theatres of, of war taking place. Then in the early 1980s, a number of things happened. And the first thing that happened was there was an attempted resurgence from Conto Esizwe. But at that point in time, we were into them. We were into them. I told you about the, <laughs> I told you about our back door. I told you about Cruiser. So Cruiser has, as, as its origin, the first deployment of South African uh, policemen in a tin, in a tin insurgency role. Uh, they were deployed into Rhodesia. A guy called Jack Buchner played a very important role in it. And, and the, one of the first lessons that they learned there was when you, when you are going to capture somebody, you don't ask them who they are, you tell them who they are. You don't ask them who they left the country with, you tell them who they left the country with. You don't ask them you know, who the instructor was, you tell them who the instructor was. Because that just that rattles their cage and that's how they became so good at turning them. So, uh, Buchner looked at this a lot and said this is a good idea and here Buchner had some other people with him and one of those guys that was with Buchner eventually came back and played a very, very big role in, uh, in, 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 in NIS and COVID operations. And that is where that is where this operation was born, Cruiser was born. The idea you get in there, you get in, you find that line, you find that channel of communication, and it goes back to those counter espionage operations that I tell you about, where I mentioned that the Russians play the game by, by the book. You will never, ever, ever get a Russian with a, with a, with a creative mind. They, they, they don't have creative minds. They are unable to exploit a situation from them. They will always go up the line and ask for, ask for permission. They will never exploit the thing on the ground. And part of the lack of creativity, although they were extremely successful in the illegal operations, part of the, of the, of the, of the Achilles heel was the, the communications. So the communications were always done in Morse code. They were always done on one specific HF radio frequency. And because it's done in Morse code, uh, you've got to have the first part of the signal. Uh, it's got to be done unencrypted. Why? Because if, if all the spies in the world know that they are being communicated with on this channel, they've got to know out of this big bundle of spaghetti which piece of spaghetti is theirs. So, they, so every spy in the world, every Russian spy in the world, would know that they've got to go onto, onto a certain, certain uh, radio frequency at a certain time, and they will, they will know. So the first thing, if you want to catch them, you've got to, uh, you've got to put surveillance on them, and you want to see are they in possession of a radio. A radio like this, a radio like this, that can pick up that frequency 
<laughs> not all radios can pick up that frequency. So do you have a radio, a commercially available radio, typically a Grundig? If you have a Grundig radio that can pick up that frequency, first tick in the tick box, then you might be a Russian spy. Second thing is, if you have that radio now, do you set that radio up at a certain time when every, when every county espionage force knows that that's when the communication happens? Yes, second tick, okay? Okay, third tick. Do you, are you in possession of a dual speed tape recorder? Dual speed tape recorder that's capable of high speed and, 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 and low speed. If you are, poof, that's it, okay? Why do you need that? Because you're gonna get your, your comms in high speed, you record it, and then you slow it down. And the third thing is, are you in possession of a crypto key called an OTP, a one-time pad? Poof, if all of those are above, a game set and match, you are a spy. And therefore, the FBI will put you in jail and you, that's it, you know, you're a spy. You don't have to prove anything else, that's it, that's espionage. That's espionage. Crypto, crypto is espionage. So, with this, uh, with this uh, whole sort of thing, sorry, I'm losing, I'm losing my track of thought now. Can I say some water, please? Just, no, just, just recover here. Sorry, what, what was I talking about there? Cheers. Um, <coughs> sorry, what was I talking about? Just remind me how. I was not track of thought. Yeah. So you, you were talking about how you knew oh, okay, the, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the Russian because of the... Oh, yeah, okay, okay. So we were talking about how we selected these different... Uh, these, okay, so, so one of the things that we, that, we, that we noted was that the Russians had taught in Gordoises. So MK was also very structured. unimaginative, very yeah. structured, very unimaginative in their comms. So Cruiser was born. The cruiser was born, you got into that comms line and you listen to what's going on and you just eventually intercept everything that, that comes their way. So you can read the orders, the part two orders, or whatever, yeah. before they're being deployed, you know who's on strength, what they're carrying, where they're going, you, you know all that stuff. Okay? So you know it. So, so, so we did that and we, and we, and we, uh, we became very successful at that. But then while learning from the other intelligence services, we, we decided that our best kind of role model is going to be a fusion of what the Israelis were doing, but we also looked at our own special forces. And our own special forces were experimenting, extremely experimental, our, our recce, recce teams, 3-2, these guys, extremely experimental, very fast learning people. And we learned from these guys, and in particular, two, two guys, a guy called uh, Didis Dirichs and a guy called Chris Stadler. And they were, uh, there was another guy, Nevis Matthias, uh, but the Didis and, 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 and Chris were the, were the main guys. And in that process, I oh, sorry, no, sorry, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm getting jumped up. I was talking about the early 19, 1980s, but, but what is happening now? So in the early, early 1980s, you had the internal situation controlled by the police, external situation, SADF, you know, up there. Then came your smoke shells and those sort of things, and suddenly it started becoming conventional, becoming really proper conventional stuff. Nothing that we could really do in that space. That wasn't really our terrain. We weren't really into that space at that point in time, okay? We were into, into the internal space. But because we'd run, or we started to run Cruiser, we noted that, that MK was resurging inside South Africa. So we decided to put that lid on this thing. Put that in on this thing. And I can't say very much more about Cruiser because it's still a sensitive operation to this day. But what I can say about Cruiser is that you speak to any SADF guy, I've yet to hear of an SADF person that engaged in, in, in a proper combat action against Nkonto West Sizwe. I've yet to meet that person. There's stories that MK was there somewhere in the background, but they were never, I, I'm not aware of any. Wherever they were engaged, they were engaged normally by the police, sometimes by special forces, typically crossing the border because of cruiser. So cruiser knew where they were coming, they were interdicted, and they, they never made. So the bottom line was in the early 1980s, a couple of interesting things started happening. And the one interesting thing was that it became very clear to us because we penetrated now through these different channels 
we make some very deep penetrations into the ANC, SACP, PAC was a bit more difficult for whatever reason, but we made some very deep penetrations into, into these uh, entities overseas, and we were really getting into their heads now. We were smoking with their copper. And uh, part of it was, particularly in London, London, the SACP uh, 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 members in exile were mostly white, they were mostly Jewish, and they were, they were, they were fairly well connected in London. And uh, we got into that, they felt safe. All of them felt very, very safe in that space. And they didn't know that we had this backdoor capability to listen to all their comms. They didn't know that. So they were talking freely. They would, uh, uh, security, security consciousness is a very difficult thing to maintain over a period of time. Yeah. And I'd like to say at that point in time, uh, something came on our radar screen which was very unfortunate. The CCB and you started getting uh, the Craig Williamson Operation Longreach started doing some very silly things overseas and that caused us in NI a huge amount of concern. And one of the things that happened was for some reason uh, Williamson and his crew decided to go and burn down the ANC office in London. Now that was one of the most stupid things you can do because we penetrated that office. We had surveillance devices in the office. We were listening to everything that was going on there. It was a gold mine of information. And the reason why it was a gold mine of information was because they felt so safe. They felt that they could talk whatever they wanted to talk about there. Now suddenly Williamson comes along and plants a, plants a, a, a firebomb there. And suddenly now everyone is aware of their safety. But more importantly, up until that moment in time, there was an ongoing kind of truce between our intelligence services and the British intelligence services because of a mutual interest in the IRA. So they kind of tolerated us and we kind of tolerated them and remember we were cooperating on this on these on the spy catching stuff. So there was this funny little grey area world where we were cooperating with them, but kind of the rules of the game was don't come and play in our backyard and don't burn down you know, our houses here. Don't come and cause trouble in our backyard. If you do that we're gonna hit you. Kind of logical, okay? Yeah. And was that just lack of communication? It was just it was it was poor planning. It was just badly thought through. It was a, there was internal rivalries. There was a whole lot of things in it. But nonetheless, those operations started to cause us trouble. And and I can I can speak at great length about that. Uh, but uh, but nonetheless, then we started realizing that there was there was a power struggle, a huge power struggle, starting to emerge between the ANC and a thing called the UDF. The ANC had virtually no capacity in South Africa and MK had been completely crushed, didn't exist. And that's very significant. Most people don't realize that to yeah. the extent that happened. So you started getting in the 1980s a resurgence of bombings, etc., etc., as an attempt by MK to claim back space because the UDF was claiming that space. So there was this huge power struggle. Now we couldn't penetrate the UDF because there were too many entities. But we could penetrate the ANC, we had for, for a long time. And it was in that context that a couple of really unfortunate things started to happen. And one of them was there was an overlap of a, of a foreign intelligence service. I, 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 I don't want to talk too much about that overlap because it's probably still sensitive to this day, but there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a national from a foreign country uh, who had a girlfriend, they always had girlfriends. And the girlfriend was involved in smuggling uh, uh, bomb parts across the borders. I, I, I mention the name because it's a, it's a matter of public uh, public knowledge now. Her name is Helena Pasteurs. And Helena Pasteurs was involved in smuggling the Pretoria car bomb across the border. She was involved in bringing in those bits and pieces of names. Remember I told you earlier on that we had smuggled with that, with the cash. So you now know that when the Pretoria car bomb thing came together, we didn't have all of our preemptive information. We didn't, we, we didn't know it was going to happen at a given time in a given place. But suddenly the Pretoria bomb goes off. Go boom. While the bomb planters were arming the device. So the fast acting, the slow acting fuse was in fact a fast acting fuse. That got my, got my eyes thinking, okay. I had a bit of a flashback then. And what then happened was, it was clear, I would say that the Pretoria car bomb was probably to South Africa what 
9-11 was to America. This was an act of extreme violence in the capital city uh, against our military establishment, an act of defiance, an act of great, great violence, great savagery. And it clearly it had to be responded to. So now going back to the old Israeli sort of thing, so what do we do now? And at that point in time, there was a lot of rivalry within the different, uh, the different security force uh, players, especially within the elite units. There was a huge amount of unnecessary uh, friction and competition and rivalry. And a decision was made at that point in time to deploy special force teams to go and follow up. And within special forces at that time, they were going through a very difficult, awkward transition period. A lot of Rhodesians had come down, a lot of ex Rhodesian special forces had come down, and they had formed an entity known as Delta 40, Delta 40, D40. And D40 consisted of quite a few ex Salute Scouts. But their culture was completely different to our Special Forces culture. And you talk to any Special Forces guy, they'll talk about that at that time. So the retaliation from, from Special Forces was, it, let me just put it this way, unfortunate. Because in the case of the Mozambican operation, D40 was used. And the D-40 guys had no real sort of sense of surgical strikes. Uh, uh, it was Skopskit and Donner kind of stuff. And they went in on, on a flying column into Mozambique and they shot up a whole lot of different uh, civilians, etc. And there was just a huge outcry from the United Nations. And it was just a, just a, completely, uh, a, a completely abortive operation. There was a very competent recce team that went into Zambia. Very, very sophisticated operation that they launched. I don't want to talk about that. That was probably one of the most successful of, the, of, of, of that suite of operations. Then there was another one in Gaborone where uh, some civilians were shot up. And once again, a lot of collateral damage. You must remember that Botswana at that point in time had been relatively neutral in the this, in this struggle. And the South African our Intelligence Service and the, and the Botswana Intelligence Service had very close coordination. But now suddenly we've got guys going over there, much like this thing in London where, you know, where, where, where Craig Brimson goes and burns a, the office of the ANC in, 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 in Benton Street. Uh, suddenly uh, that creates unnecessary tensions. So be that as it may, it was clear that the retaliation by special forces to the Pretoria car bomb was inadequate. And it showed up a glaring, glaring, shortcoming in our security force arsenal. So at, at that point in time, with this internal rivalry of the UDF and the ANC happening, etc., etc., and with all of this now, special force activities taking place outside the country, sanctions were biting, uh, South Africa was increasingly becoming isolated. So a decision was made. I think a very important decision was made that in all probability South Africa is going to start losing its diplomatic presence overseas. Therefore, we cannot rely on intelligence gathering out, out of embassies. Therefore, we have to create a service within a service. And we have to create a new entity called K. Wolf Director of Kofiato Operations, Chief Director of Covert Operations. And K was created. And K was, that's where I was eventually brought into K. I was brought in from 06, because when K was created now, they, they, they used this, uh, this Charles Ord Wingert uh, model of bringing people that are competent, bringing people that have proven themselves already. And K was created, I was in 06, 06 one at the time, and they pulled me out of those operations, and they said, come, in, come into here. But I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I go through battery tests and I was, I was, the next thing I was inside K and I didn't quite know how it worked. But K was created at a very critical time because it was in the aftermath of the, of the clear shortcomings of our own highly competent special forces, highly, highly competent people. I don't in any way want to denigrate them, they were highly competent. But it's a case of, of horses for courses. It's a case of, you know, you, if, if you've only got a gun in your hand, then you're gonna, someone's going to get shot and there's going to be collateral damage. You've got to do these things surgically. And that's where the Mossad came in. They did things differently. They did things surgically. Surgical, surgical. Absolute precision 
they know uh, precision surgical strike, no collateral damage. So, so K was created using the, 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 to a certain extent, the Israeli common blueprint. And I mentioned now, earlier on in this conversation, I mentioned those two operations, those two particular Israeli operations, the, uh, the, the Munich uh, massacre and, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the other one, the, the, the capture of Adolf Eichmann. They suddenly became prominent because in the midst of while K was being created as a service within a service, you must appreciate you want to unbundle now. So you've got your whole structure here, uh, the whole MI structure, very sophisticated, been going on institutionally for quite a long time. And its uh, headquarters is the Concilium building in Pretoria. Now you're going to create a, a standalone entity, but you can't take your people from there into the new entity because they're going to contaminate the new entity. So you've got a, a management challenge of note because your senior management people have to come from here. Yeah. They're going to start this new unit, but all these guys must be clean. Right. So there's like a, there's a conundrum. So what they did was they, they broke away from Concilium and they started at this other entity here. And that was a satellite entity at arm's length away from this. And these people could go there. Those people couldn't go there. So compartmentation was applied. Then from this structure here now, going out, there were other COVID structures. And they, they were manned by clean people. And because I was under deep cover in counter espionage, I was offered a, a position. I didn't know what the position was for. But I said, yes, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, 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 I'll make myself available. And within K now, they created this, this service within a service. And the mission objective of K was to be able to operate as a completely self-sufficient standalone entity in the absence of any diplomatic support from any embassy anywhere in the world. So we had to create an ability to operate where it was of strategic importance. So these are all strategic operations. These are not tactical operations. These are strategic level operations. So it was a strategic unit uh, and it, it, uh, uh, we've got to be able to develop all of the necessary bits and pieces that you need to keep yourself going. So we had to break away from the communications. We had to develop our own communication. We had to break, everything was our own stuff. Develop your own stuff. Go out, find commercially available stuff. Do the best you can, but don't rely on this stuff because we are now emulating what the Russians were doing, what the illegals were doing. We were going to put illegals in the field, but we didn't have the luxury of what the Russians had 20 years of, 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 you know, of time planning. We didn't have it. Yeah. We had to do that in six months. What, mm -hmm. what the Russians would do in, 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 in 20 years, we would do in six months. And that was replicated by our arms people, you know, you know when, they, when they, they made missiles, you know. <laughs> we, we had to do in one year what, what the Americans would do in 10 years. So we just accelerated this learning stuff. And that was, I think, one of our, our characteristics. But then, be that as it may, a very, very important moment comes in the history of national intelligence. After after this special forces raid, set of raids in retaliation to the Pretoria car bomb, and a decision is made that these raids were not successful, we still have to retaliate. But we've got to do it through a different means. And that, 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 that task was then given to COVID operations to come. And I would almost say that that was kind of like their coming of age, because they were only created in the early 1980s. And one of their, one of their first big operations now was uh, tracking down and, and gathering of, of intelligence to ultimately enable the capture of the Nkonto OSCs were chief of staff because it was they who planted the bomb. They planted the bomb. So the decision was made that we will, do, we will replicate that Adolf Eichmann case. And we will go for that one guy, and it must be surgical, surgical, not one drop of blood must be spilt, not one hair must be ruffled of any other civilian. We must be surgically going there and we must capture Adolf Eichmann. And I found myself now, un unbeknownst to me, I was now in this team. This team, this team was, uh, all, of, all of the K members, were, all of the, uh, the K units had the, had the, uh, the prefix K, Kofert, Kofert Operation K, IDKO, HDKO, in English Chief Director of Covenant Operations, but everything was, it's a very Afrikaans organization. And ironically, in this very Afrikaans organization, one of the shortcomings was lack of English skills. So within K, within, uh, because we had to operate under deep cover in a foreign hostile environment for prolonged periods of time, small teams operations, DDs, that had to come into this thing. 
but we had to be proficient in multiple languages. So we had to start rapidly developing the, the multi-language skills. And of course, if you could speak English as mother tongue, suddenly you were an advantage. <laughs> so I found myself in, in, in K, and K was divided down to K1. K1 was the headquarters uh, entity that was this entity here. I told you this is Consilium, and then this is, this is now the breakaway entity here. So that's K1, that's called K1. And out of K1 are two other satellite, in, uh, sorry, three, uh, well, other satellite entities. We still don't know how many to this day. Um, but the, the other one, one of them was K2. They were responsible for South Africa, COVID, internal COVID operations. K3, external COVID operations. And each of those had a K21, K22, K31, K32, if we must have. And they were, they were further removed. But then there was another entity called K4. So K4 is there somewhere, and I was in K43. So that means there was a K42 and a K41, and maybe even a K45, we don't know, okay? K44, we don't know. But uh, I was in K43, that's all I know. And in K43, the interesting thing about K43 was it was made up of people, most of whom had not served in the service before. I was one of the only people in K43 that had prior service exposure, but because of the fact that it was deep cover counter espionage operations, I hadn't been exposed to, to the normal, this normal service stuff. And uh, uh, to my surprise, there were, there, were, there were two other guys in the unit that were English speaking. And one of them was a former recce. Uh, I, I can mention his name because he's, uh, he's now on with us, a guy called Peter, Peter Bowles. Peter Bowles was a very, very, uh, very competent uh, former recce. And um, uh, he was an absolute level headed, really, really rock solid guy. I can't mention the other guy's name, he's still alive now, but, but, but he was also a very, very competent. Uh, SADF guy, okay? and um, an officer, and, and just a very, very competent guy. And the three of us, we were the sort of English capability within the unit, and then the rest of them were, were extremely competent people. Quite a few of them came from the uh, Special Task Force, what we would call you know, today the Special Task Force. And in those days, uh, uh, because of the hijacking threat, uh, quite a few of the guys came from the anti-hijacking unit. Uh, I went to talk about hijacking, I'm talking about uh, aircraft hijacking. Yeah. Uh, the sky marshals, the deep cover sky marshals, guys that would fly in airplanes on long haul flights. So, so quite a few of them uh, were there and, and quite a few of the guys were, were ex-bomb squad people. So people that had you know, defusing bombs and whatever. So, so a diverse uh, set of skills. And in fact, I've got one of the manuals here I've got here. So one of the, the, and the, the, and how, many, how many people would be involved in, in let's say, four teams? Um, not not too many, but yeah, I'll just show you. So this, so this is this is one of the manuals. <laughs> so this manual, it's a IED manual, improvised explosive devices, and you'll see it was actually handwritten. <laughs> it was actually handwritten. That, that's the handwritten manual, you know, of of of, of, uh, of the whole IED manual. So, so it was, uh, that was written by by one of the guys in K4. Um, the unit was very small. We never, we never knew because of the special compartmented SCI thing. We never knew how many was out there. If you didn't need to know, you didn't know. And our mission was to go and capture the chief of staff from Punta Arenas. And I've written that up in a book. I've written it up in the uh, book of Shaking Hands on Billy. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. But, but the uh, the 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 mission was a small teams operation, classic small teams operation. And uh, it was uh, it involved a lot of close-in surveillance, so we had to develop a close-in surveillance capability, and that we learned from the British. The British had a formidable close-in surveillance capability, formidable uh, uh, in Ireland. They, they they would penetrate deep into Ireland, deep deep into Ireland. So we learned from them about that close-in surveillance capability. So we developed a formidable, formidable close-in surveillance capability. And uh, I can I can tell you lots of stories about that, but, uh, but you know as we learned it went on the way. But nonetheless, we developed this capability, and um, we were deployed now in small teams. And the initial deployment for 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 the for the for the capture of MK Chief of Staff was uh, given the, the mission objective of we first had to find where the man is, where is he. Uh, uh, the justification was given to us by saying that uh, we're going to put this man on trial, going to put him before before a judge. We're not we're not we're not judge, jury, and executioner. We're not that at all. 
we are there to simply we are there to simply effect the effect the arrest. That's what we're going to do. We're going to catch him and we're going to bring him back home safely, and then we're going to put him in front of you know, in front of a court of law. Uh, we want to we want to maintain the moral high ground as the Israelis did with uh, with Alpha Eichmann. And uh, the first thing we had to do was to find out where the guy was. Where, where is he? Because he was an extremely elusive guy. Joe Slover was a formidable person. Joe Slover was not a was not a Mickey Mouse person by any stretch of imagination. He was a formidable operator. Uh, senior officer in the KGB, highly trained, but we know the KGB were very rigid in the way they, do, they did things. But Joe was a very, very formidable guy. So one of the first things we had to do was we had to figure out how to find out where he was. And in that regard, we fell back onto the old tactics that we used, that, that we that, you know about this penetration, penetration. So we started penetrating different places and we uh, effected a, a penetration into a safe house run by the, yeah, by the Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, I can't tell you how we did the penetration, but it was a sensitive penetration, but we effected a penetration. Um, I can tell you some of the tools of, the tools of that trade. I'll not say that to the tools of that trade, but, but um, we effected a penetration and we uh, had some, some real-time surveillance going. And we found, to our surprise, there was a, uh, a safe house in Anson Road, 43 Anson Road in London, consisted of six units, six compartments, six flatlets in a cluster, and one of them was uh, under the control of a Communist Party of Great Britain guy, and the other five were, were available to SACP guys. And we put that place under surveillance, and uh, with that surveillance, we started picking up. We really had other places under surveillance, uh, but, uh, but, but Joe, who was given the code name of Billy, he was given the code name of Billy. Uh, we could uh, we could never pick him up on the other surveillance platforms. So when we came in onto 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 this um, Anson Road uh, uh, target area, we picked up a lot of movement of people, a huge amount of movement of people, and then suddenly we had this breakthrough that we picked up Billy Billy. And uh, at that point in time, I was part of the sort of, uh, the close in surveillance team. Now you must appreciate when you're doing close in surveillance like that, you're in a foreign hostile environment, you can't use radio communications. And this is in the time before WhatsApps and before, you know, before, uh, before data and before, before mobile phones. So it's extremely difficult. So, so you, you do surveillance in a, in a very, very precise way. And a, a typical surveillance team in, in your own country would be about 20 to 30 people strong. And in the surveillance team, you'd have a motorcycle guy, you'd have a car people, you'd have walkers, you'd have, you know, you even potentially have a helicopter you know, at your disposal if you needed it. Uh, over there in a foreign hostile environment, you can't have any of it. You've got a small team of people. So we operated in small teams. The biggest of our small teams was probably five, five in size, biggest of the small teams. So already that puts you under severe, severe pressure. And we kept the team separate from each other for various reasons. Kept them completely separate. So if one was compromised, then the other ones would still remain clean. And because we couldn't use radio comms, we had to do a lot of it was hand signals, etc. And in fact, I recall when I was doing surveillance on uh, on, uh, on 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 Billy's house, um, uh, 13 Lime Street. Uh, for the first the first surveillance we put on the first eyes on target, we put on, on Lime Street. Uh, I was designated to go in and walk down the street and just get a feel for it. And I made a decision in, in those days, I, uh, we, we used to use very small cameras, but we can't go around the, you know, with a camera to your eye. So I, I went to a um, McDonald's hamburger shop and I bought myself a, a McDonald's and then I used the McDonald's packet. And I made a hole in the packet and I put my camera inside that. So I had my hand inside the McDonald's packet and that's how I could, I could walk down the road with my hand inside the packet. And as I was uh, you know, uh, 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 controlling the camera, and as I was doing that, a Bobby walks up, a policeman, hello, 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 whatever you yeah, mate. And I, you know, I gave him the story, you know, the standard story, that's where the English language comes in, although obviously they could hear that I wasn't a pommy. I was uh, given the way that this was this was Lime Street is in London, and uh, it was in a very working class part of London, and the working class people were very socialist part of part of London, and they were very suspicious of outsiders. So uh, anyhow, I managed to sort of uh, dodge the bullet with the body, and we got our first photographs, and from from the first photographs we can now start doing photographic analysis of the target, 
and um, we could we found that his house was an extremely difficult house to penetrate because it was uh, it was backed up onto a, a canal. So you had this uh, this uh, road going past, uh, Lime Street going past the front of the house, and then you had this canal. And the problem now was that um, uh, there, there was duplex houses, uh, working class suburb, and uh, there's, there's no privacy there. You know, if you're trying to do a penetration there, someone's going to look out the window and see that you're fiddling around with your telephone cable or doing something like that. You know, they're going to they're going to raise their alarm. So we would always like to have a back door. We always like to have a, a multiple escape routes planned beforehand, so that if something goes wrong, you can escape. And um, uh, anyhow, so we decided at that point in time that Lime Street we couldn't do. We, you know, it was not possible to, to, to put surveillance on that. And that's when we then started looking at other places like Anson Road and, and those sort of things. But uh, anyhow, we, uh, lots of stories. I haven't got time to go into all the details now. But, the, but, but ultimately, we developed this formidable capability there. And uh, when, we, uh, when, we, uh, when we had our first eyes on target, once you got first eyes on target, Suddenly now you can start moving, you start jumping, you start jumping you know, uh, ahead of the target and you can start moving uh, where the target is. And um, a decision had to then be made, once we had eyes on target now and once we had we, we, you know, uh, more details on him, uh, we picked him up at Anson Road. And, and from that moment onwards we had to start deciding now where we're going to go with it. Are we going to, are we going to, are we going to capture him there? Or are we going to, where are we going to capture him? And the decision was made, I, I was a strong opponent of the decision to capture him in London. Uh, I put forward a, a strong, strongly articulated case that in my professional opinion, if we captured him in London, we would be doing ourselves a grave, grave disservice because at that point in time, Maggie Thatcher was the boss and we, were, we, had, we had in her, not necessarily an ally, but at least one of our last few friends. And uh, if we got to antagonize her on remembering what, uh, what Williamson and these guys did by burning down the ANC offices, if we're going to antagonise them any further, we are going to, you know, we're going to, uh, going to be, 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 be doing the wrong thing, I think. So I put in the, the case that I believe we should capture him in Africa, and we should capture him preferably in Mozambique. So if we can capture him in Mozambique, it's just so much easier to then you know, capture him, put him in a safe place, and then just, just you know, uh, 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 bring in a, uh, a chopper and, and, and fly him out. So that's, that was that operation. I was in the surveillance team and you know, once my surveillance team work was done, I was then withdrawn and, 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 and redeployed into other stuff. Um, so that, that is the one operation that I can, that I can talk about. And uh, ultimately we never captured Joe Slav, we never captured him. But the skills and the capabilities that we developed there were, were, were of great importance to, for us in other, in other operations because all, uh, all of the other operations were done in such a way that they were almost, almost continuous. You know, you'd start off one thing and, 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 and if it runs to the dead end, you kill it. But if not, it just morph into something else and morph into something else and morph into it. They just keep following and keep learning and iterating. So this, uh, I mentioned Cruiser early on. So Cruiser was going and Cruiser was doing very, very well. And then Cruiser just morphed, it metastasized, you know, into, into another little module, another little module, another little modules. And uh, one of them was, I think, called Spaghetti. And Spaghetti was, uh, was uh, running in London, similar to Cruiser. I was directly involved in Spaghetti. Uh, and uh, Spaghetti started giving us the same intelligence that Cruz uh, gave us. And, and the reason why we started Spaghetti was to trust on homing in on, 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 on Joe Slava, on Billy. And then, then Spaghetti, uh, we managed to do so, a number of penetrations of the SACP houses. And Spaghetti ran into a dead end when uh, it was brought up in the House of Parliament. The British House of Parliament uh, had, a, had a, um, a special session uh, where they spoke about South African you know, uh, uh, penetration, uh, planting bugs. In, a, in, a, in, in, in the, the house of a gentleman called Harold Wolpe, member of the South African Communist Party, and this thing ended up in the House of, Co house of Commons being debated. And uh, that was our, our operation. And of course, uh, uh, to this day, I don't fully understand what happened in that operation. I still don't fully understand how we were compromised. But what I, what I do know is that when they were discussing it in, house, in the House of Commons, it came as a great surprise to us, I was the project handler, it came as a great surprise to us to hear that the street in which the target was living was under surveillance by the British anti-terrorism unit because of IRA activity and we didn't know that and had we known that we would not have done that operation, had we known that we would not have done that penetration, so we did that penetration under the nose of the anti-terrorist the anti unit and it was undetected by them because in fact in the House of Commons 
the, the debate was now, how come we're funding the anti-terrorist unit guys and this is happening under their noses. So, so we didn't want that, we wanted to de-escalate that, you know, we wanted to keep a good relationship going, we didn't want to sort of, you know, sort of crop in their sly and do anything bad like that, but nonetheless, yeah, there's that. And then out of spaghetti, so you've got cruiser, then you've got spaghetti, then you've got another one, hard to call, hard to call. They're also the same sort of thing. After, after spaghetti was compromised, we just ran another one, hard to call. And then it just the uncompromised part, we just carried on doing the same sort of thing. And that became of great, great, great importance to us because uh, I now want to just jump, a, jump ahead, uh, ahead of time and try and link it up now to, to the SADF. So let's start getting those links going to the SADF. So, so, so I think the first link to the SADF is that we, in covert operations, I think owe SADF a debt of gratitude in the sense that they're highly innovative people, highly innovative guys, uh, um, taught us a lot. And we, we took their stuff to another level. I'm talking specifically about the small teams people. They taught us a lot about small teams operations. And I'd like to just talk a little bit now about, about some of our small teams uh, operations. Uh, and I, I'll expand a bit on that, uh, on that now. And that's, that's the first thing I'd like to say. So and I thank you very much to the to, the, to, to Didi's and to, and to Chris that they, they were probably the, the pioneers of that space. We learned a lot about, about small teams operations and uh, I, I, I think we took it to another level. I, I like to think that we took it to another, another level. And then um, I think the, um, the second thing that I'd like to say is that we, we made a contribution back at a very difficult time in the 1987s, 1988s, the build up to the big battles, the battles on the Lomba, why do you look at And at that point in time, we'd been successful in, uh, I'm skip my sequencing right now, so I'll get my sequencing right. Yeah, so we've so we been successful in, 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 in these operations, I'm talking about the article and those things, we're very successful in those operations. And the word went out now that stuff is starting to happen in Angola. The Angolan landscape is changing from a strategic perspective, what is going on. So a special operation was created within NI. Now let me just explain one thing. So in, in, within, within NI, I mentioned that we had K. K probably consisted at its peak of maybe 120, 140 people, maybe, maybe. That's a very small unit, very small, very competent people. They all had a, a unique number. Their force numbers were all unique. And the reason why you had to have a unique force number was that all of the admin, there's a lot of admin in this business. If you're going to have a cup of coffee somewhere while doing surveillance, you claim it back and you've got to put in a financial claim and you've got to have a you know, force number, you know, force number, claim and you know, put in the receipt and all that kind of stuff. So, so, the, so the, the force numbers were very specific for the COVID guys. And whenever I talk to a wannabe, there's so many wannabes in this business, and talk to a wannabe, I just ask them, what's your force number? And uh, I'm not going to tell you how the force number was structured, because I'm going to tell the wannabes that no, they're going to come back with the force number. I think, no, no, I think Gurekis have something similar, well, operator number or... Yeah, I don't know, but, yeah, but we, 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 we had our force number. And that's it. If you don't know your force number, then you were never there. So don't, don't come with your nonsense. You were never there, okay? So, 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 so that was the... Uh, no, the, 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 the unique indicator, okay? So, um, no, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought again now. I'm, 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 you were talking how the, the 87, 88, uh, Michael oh, yes. the Hooper. Okay, okay, so now, so now, I'm going to get my, get my full spec now. So, so at that point in time, it starts becoming clear from strategic intelligence work that NI is doing, that SADF is not involved in. Because the SAD has got their hands full. They've got their hands full in their garden. So it starts becoming very clear to us that something is happening in the USSR. And the Russians get beaten in Afghanistan. The Russians were beaten in Afghanistan. And that was a very important moment, I think, because. And I started focusing on that thing quite strongly now. 
We knew a lot about how the Russian intelligence services work. We, we had a lot of cooperation with other intelligence services, you know, in the anti-Russian, anti-USSR anti, uh, stuff. So we, you know, we really knew that space very well. That, we knew the space a thousand times better than the SAD would ever know that space. I'm confident of that. So we started saying, listen, there's something happening in, uh, there's something happening in the USSR. Something's happening. We don't know what exactly, but something's happening. And then, of course, the Russians are pulled out of Afghanistan. They say they, they weren't defeated. They, you know, they make all kinds of stories. Gorbachev comes to power. Gorbachev makes all kinds of claims. Suddenly, ah, this thing is not looking good. And, uh, it looks like the USS is going to implode. Then all of a sudden, the Cubans start becoming very dominant on the battlefield. Until then, the Cubans were quite you know, the more subdued and controlled by the Russians. Suddenly now, the Russians are un unable to control the Cubans on the battlefield important thing and we now understand how this, all these lines of communication work we know that the uh, that the uh, the Cubans function very much like the like the Russians they play by the book they, they, they don't uh, devolve authority down to their lowest level they just don't do that so we uh, we, uh, uh, we we know that so we make a decision we are going to penetrate the line of chain of command from the top to the tactical headquarters in Angola, we had to penetrate the China command. And a special task team is formed. I must just yeah, I must just explain about, about the special task team. So in our standard operations, you would get a sip and you get a sop. A kip, a kip or a sop. A kip is a quote of the ensemblings break. And that is that is a, an ongoing operation. A kip and then an SO, special operation. And you want you, you want to get your number, your KIP number, KIP 5 of 1983 or whatever. And then all your claims go to that KIP 5 of 1983 or your admin, all about admin. But you want wants an SO number, special operation number. That, that SO is given now an operation name and that's a different thing. So special operations was a domain of special operations people. And there were, I mentioned there were 120, maybe 150 members of K. Inside that space, there were a small number of people, I don't want to give the exact number, small number of people that were in the SO space, in the special operations space. Small number. And the special operations people, they were, they were, they were, they were sort of like you know, uh, targeted for specific purposes, fit for purpose. Like, so so the, 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 the kids would do their normal thing and then the SOs would, would do it differently and they'd have to be controlled and coordinated. So a decision is made now, we've got to try and penetrate this. We've got to get an agent in place. So we start working on that line. We start working on the line. We do, so, we, so if, if nothing else, we're repetitive. You know? no. yeah, we've learned from the Russians, we can also repeat, okay? So we repeat the article thing, we repeat the whole, you know, the cruiser thing, we repeat this whole thing. We just replicate, what can we do the same thing? And um, we get lucky. We get lucky, not by skill, not by anything, we get lucky. And we manage to make a penetration. Now, I must explain this to you now. We make this penetration. First thing when you make a penetration, and you now have a warm body that you're talking to. Why is that? Firstly, who is that person? Secondly, why are they willing to talk to you? Thirdly, are they under control? Are they under control by that side? Are they sent to, to, as a plot to you? You don't know these things. So this is, a, this is a different game. So I'm designated as the handler for this individual. So I'm handling him now. And he's starting to give me intelligence about the Cubans. But now you need to understand that when you're running an operation like that, high risk, uh, great uncertainty, inf information from, 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 from conflicting sources of different you know, levels of, of, of truthfulness. You know, you're going you're gonna to feed all that stuff through to a decision maker. And if you are not really sure about the, the, the truthfulness of this material, then you're going to you know, end up with, uh, with egg on your face. So at that point in time, the standard procedure, we also had our standard operational procedures. What you would normally try and do is you normally try and have three agents in place. Three was a magical number. Any more was better, but three was great. And the reason why you want three is you want those three to never ever know about the existence of the other. 
and you want at least two of those three to be present in the same place at the same time and they must be reporting on the same events and they must preferably be reporting on each other. So from that you can start developing the truthfulness mm -hmm. of each person. But the other thing that you want to do, and this is a very important thing I'm going to say now, is based on the information given by that agent, we would bring that back to our, to our, our, our analytical people. And the first thing that they would look at is does this, does this uh, reflect what the, what the given picture is like? You know in the army when you get your orders, a given picture, what's the given picture? What's the known situation? Does this conflict or confirm with the known situation? And now we start getting information from this agent. We've got one agent in place. We don't have means of, of verifying. We don't have a whole lot of in, in information against which we can test the veracity of this now because we, you know, so this is a new thing we're opening up. And normally it would take time for you to start you know, developing the intelligence source and, and, and the more information you put in, the more it gets evaluated and therefore ultimately you can then start uh, you know, saying this guy is trustworthy or, you know, or, or he's not trustworthy or sometimes he's trustworthy. So this was the, this was the conundrum we had. And this guy started telling us some really interesting things that we didn't know about. And these were things of great, great importance. And so let me just sort of, you know, uh, to tell what the typical SADF guy would be interested in. So the first thing that, they were, that, that we started learning was there was pushback in Cuba against the, Ang the, the Angolan operation. There was pushback. There was growing pushback. And the growing pushback were from the mothers and the wives. They didn't like what was happening there. And I must also say that they were, they, were, they were telling us that this pushback was of such a significance that it was being felt in, in Havana. It was becoming politically relevant. Now, when you get that information, it, now does, how does this tie in with what you know about Cuba? Is, you know, is this true? Is this nonsense? Is it, what, what is this? And we start looking back for historic precedents. And in 1974, 75, thereabouts, there was this carnation revolution in, in Portugal when the Portuguese mothers were, were unimpressed that their sons and their, their husbands and brothers were coming back uh, maimed and injured and you know, maybe in body bags. So it was possible. It was plausible. It was plausible. So we kept, it, we kept running them. Then, then we started getting information back from that about, the, about the, 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 what was motivating Castro, why Castro was doing what he was doing. And we started developing a very interesting understanding of the fact that the Cuban decision-making machinery was not united. It was, in fact, fractured. And it's no different to the African National Congress today, where you've got factions. They're also factionalized. And they, 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 he was telling us about the fact that there's a nationalist faction and there's a communist faction. And these are two different factions. And then we started hearing other very, very interesting things about the fact that particularly the aggression, the absolute aggression that was being shown as the Russians were, de were becoming depleted after Gorbachev, after 1985, after Gorbachev, the Russian forces were, were being downsized and were being withdrawn. Russia had been defeated in Afghanistan and that defeat was having implications. And when Gorbachev came to power, there were serious ramifications in Russia. And one of the ramifications was that Russia could no longer afford the arms race. They could no longer afford to keep their forces in the field. So just as it was biting us financially, it was biting them even more. So they were on the decline. The Russians were on the decline from 1985 onwards. They were definitely on the decline. And that's when the Cubans were now resurging. And then we asked the question, but how can the Cubans research? What capabilities do they have? What capacity do they have? And we started getting into the head of Fidel. And it goes down to the fact that in the Bay of Pigs, when the Bay of Pigs happened, Castro developed a deep hatred for the Americans, for the CIA, a deep, deep, profound hatred. And he wanted to give them a bloody nose wherever he could. But because of another event that took place in Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Castro had a deep, intrinsic distrust for the Russians. 
So the Cubans and the Russians went to hand in a glove situation. So this thing that, that SADF people believe today that Cubans were proxy forces for Russians is not true, just as SADF was not a proxy force for the, for the, for the Americans. Neither of us were proxy forces. We were there for our own reasons. And then we started hearing about this thing now, more and more and more. So Cuba was in fact regarded by the Russians as a maverick, maverick enterprise. And the Russians were, 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 were deeply involved in this bigger nuclear work. And they were, they were embedded, their thinking was embedded in this whole thing, mutually assured destruction, mad. But particularly a doctrine that had been developed by Henry Kissinger called the Kissinger Doctrine. And the, it was the Kissinger Doctrine that said, if, if Russia is involved in a proxy war somewhere in Africa, mm. and you start allowing your proxy forces, this, this is the proxy notion now, to get out of control, they can escalate it, and you can get drawn into a thermonuclear war because you're going to now bring in the Americans on the other side. So the Russians were saying, no, 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 you're not our proxy. You're not our proxy. Shut up. Calm down. So in Angola, it was the Russians that were the moderate people. It was the Cubans that were the more aggressive people. And this was very nuanced now because suddenly now, in the post-1985, at the, at the build-up to the big battles of the Lombard now, Cuba was starting to become more and more aggressive. Russia was losing its ability to control Cuba. But more importantly, Cuba was now taking on the logistics lines that Russia was unable to sustain. And this is where special forces come in, because special forces all launched a very significant operation, Operation Drosty. And Operation Drosty was probably one of the most sophisticated special force operations with that, 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 uh, that sank a couple of ships in the, in the Namib harbor. And that told the Russians that they could not sustain a logistical line of that magnitude. And then Didi's and his boys uh, in five recce, or five, uh, five recce, I think it was, they were, they were doing small teams operations along the railway line from, from Lobito to, uh, uh, from, yeah, from Lobito to, to Manonk. They were taking out the railway line. And that also told the Russians that they couldn't sustain this thing, this logistics line. So now suddenly Cuba's coming in and they want to sustain an even longer logistics line, a smaller nation, and we realized this could not happen. This could not work. This could not work. But now, the problem that we now had, we only had one agent in place. So we couldn't verify. We could not verify this stuff. So we could not go and, 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 and do a high-level briefing. Or we, there were high-level briefings being given on this particular thing, but the, but the, 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 the faith or the confidence level in this agent in place was such that, that we couldn't say, right, we're going to nail our color tomorrow. This is what it is, you know? So there was a, a level of uncertainty about this. And I know I've spoken to some senior people. I spoke to General Roland de Fris about this once. And I mean, he'd not heard about this stuff uh, before. And, um, you know, I'm explaining now that, that, that that's why it was. But nonetheless, we had this particular thing. And this was, uh, this was a classic example of a small team operation, a very successful operation. Time simply didn't allow us to develop to more. Because once you've got one guy in place, then you start developing number two, number three. That's how it works. It metastasizes. But we just didn't have time. Time was not on our side. So we ran this operation as hard, as hard and as aggressively as we could. And we found from that, actually, that the Cubans wanted a way out. They wanted a way out with dignity. They wanted, they wanted a way out. And in particular, the Cubans were being mauled by the artillery, our artillery. Where once the Cubans were holed up in Quito and they were being mangled by our artillery, they wanted a way out. So this became, I think, something of great strategic importance because that intelligence, as, as incomplete as it was, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, you know, I will tell you that it was incomplete intelligence, but as incomplete as that intelligence was, that intelligence played a very important role in laying the groundwork for the... Uh, for the eventual uh, negotiations around the Cuban troop withdrawal. In fact, I had one occasion because I was involved, I was handling this agent in, uh, in place, and so I was flying into, into and out of the target country a lot. Uh, um, I was actually meeting him up in, a, you know, in his third country principal, I'd meet him you know, in a third country. And uh, 
I just come back from one of these uh, operations and uh, I handed my report in, and um, I found myself in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bar somewhere, and there was General Yanni Galdemes in the bar <laughs> next to me, and uh, he didn't know me, and I, I knew him, but he didn't know me, and he didn't know that I was involved in this stuff. And it was just a funny little feeling that, you know, my, my team was busy feeding the intelligence into his negotiation team that was, that was doing the work out with the Cairo round, I don't know if it which one, there's a whole lot of these different, uh, different meetings. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, put us uh, in, in, in some sort of position of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of knowledge, if, if not authority. And then, I'm going to start wrapping up by, by saying that with the success of those operations, as incomplete as they were, a decision was made now, we, because with the, uh, with the spaghettis and all those other operations running, we knew that the ANC was extremely concerned that they were losing authority to the UDF. They were extremely concerned. Uh, in, the, in the early 1990s, the rolling mass action in South Africa was all, all UDF, all UDF, not ANC. Uh, the, the Seven Days War, the Nine Days War in, in KZN, yeah, that was that was all UDF, yeah, that, was, that was all faction. So, so there, there are two operations I want to talk about there, uh, and then, then, I'll, then I'll wrap up. So these two operations are the following. The first operation was we needed to verify whether Russia was in fact collapsing. Is the USSR collapsing, yes or no? And a decision was made to deploy a force to go and, to, to go and to deploy unit. And I found myself as one of those those guys, and I, I sent I sent a link to Peter. Uh, I'm, so I'm not going to give you all of that stuff. Okay. But I gave I gave a talk a while ago on that whole operation. Okay, well, we can I'm not going to I'm yeah. not going to talk about that operation. But, but in, that, in that operation, all I can say about that operation was that. It was probably the epitome of our small team's work. Certainly in my career, that was, that was probably, probably up there among, 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 among the top operations that, uh, that I'm aware of. And I, I found myself at the Berlin Wall in November 1989. And unbeknownst to me at the time, there was a KGB officer called Vladimir Putin. And he was in Dresden. And we were similar rank, him and myself. And we were both deployed in the same theater at the same time, observing the same events. And I'm going to just tell you, tell you a little story now, just to, just to sort of, uh, not to relate to this. So, so if I remember my sequences correctly, I was responsible for GDR and I was responsible for Romania. So, where do you spread? You spread thin. That's what happens. Yeah. Thick, it's been, it's been thin like Marmite on, the, on, on your toast. So in Romania, what happened was very interesting because in Romania there was a spontaneous uprising by the people. And that spontaneous uprising happened in a place called Timisoara. And a lot of things happened in Timisoara. But in Timisoara, the ordinary people got hot for and they rose up. They rose up. There was a, there was there was a couple of incidents. The one incident was the son of the president was riding a Porsche, and he knocked over a civilian, and the people got angry. And then there was another one that that, that didn't receive much sort of uh, attention, but that that was one of the important factors in this process. And then the other thing that happened was there was a guy called Laszlo Tokes, I think his name was. And he was a local minister of religion, and he was he was a bit of an activist. He was a bit of a Julius Malema type of person, and he was he was an activist, frontline activist. And people came out in support of, of Tux. And these things came together in Timiswara. And Timiswara tried to put down this uprising, and it became known as the Timiswara massacre. And they buried the bodies there. And in Timiswara, the the, the 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 whole order of battle changed because for the first time in the history of that place the ordinary people rose up and they penetrated the, the, the headquarters of the Securitate, which is the Securitate is the, is the Stasi, the KGB of, of Romania. 
So they penetrated this place and when they got into this building, they found whiskey and they found stuff that ordinary people don't have. And that just inflamed the crowds. And there was, uh, there was there's an overlap there with, this, with the, uh, the, the, the security data with the intelligence service, but they're also like a police, a secret police thing. So they had armored vehicles and you know, that kind of stuff. And, and suddenly people started, uh, started rising up against these armored vehicles and they killed some security data officers. And there was one incident where an ordinary civilian was urinating on the body of the security data officer. And it was very clear to me that this was an important moment. But you know, you're in the thick of things, you don't quite know how it's going to pan out tomorrow or the next day. You just know, you get a sense that this is quite significant. So it was in the context of that thing that ultimately the mass uprising became so significant that the securitates shifted sides and they joined the people. And this was an important observation because up until then the security had oppressed the people, now the security was on the side of the people. And that was a very, 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 very important thing that, uh, that, 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 that we observed. Just a very subtle observation, but an important observation. And I think that Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Putin had also observed the same phenomenon. Because a short while later, a few days, maybe a week or two later, to be at the exact date, the same thing happened in Dresden. And a group of people were now rising up against the Stasi. And right in the vicinity of the Stasi headquarters was the KGB office. And this mob descended upon it. I think with this whole thing, I mean, I can't, I'm, I'm speculating now, but having it's seen this thing happen yeah. or having known what happened in, 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 in Romania, I think it was a replication of the same thing. And we were interested. We wanted to know, will Russia come to the assistance of these people? That's the answer we had to have. Will Russia come to the assistance of these people? And with this uprising, this crowd comes down the street. They want to go to the Stasi headquarters. They divert and they, and they, and they start walking towards the KGB office. And the KGB guard, guard standing duty there. And he goes running inside and he calls an officer, Putin comes out, cocky guy, comes out, and he talks to the guys, he said, listen, if you come here, we're going to shoot you. Line said, you come here, we're going to shoot you. So the East Germans are a little bit hesitant, a little bit hesitant, so Putin takes, takes control at that moment in time. Deflects, the people go back, and they go back to the, to, the, to the original line of advance onto the Stasi headquarters, so he's bought some time. Now, what we didn't know then, which we now know, with the history, with, 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 with uh, you know, the benefit of hindsight, is that Putin did what all Russians did. He asked for orders from above, and he got no, no response from Moscow. And he then sent, an, sent a signal to the commander of the tank squadron. And he said, if they come to attack us, I need your tanks to come and support. And the tank commander said, Moscow's not, I can't, I can't come without orders, Moscow is silent. Moscow is silent. And in that moment, we knew that Russia was broken. In that moment, we knew that Russia no longer had the capacity to intervene in what was then going to become the Cadessa process in South Africa, the, the negotiated ending of the, of the armed struggle. And so I'll, I'll wrap up that story because I, I was withdrawn. From, from that place at that moment in time. But, but, but what I observed there was this, was this, you know, when the local security forces switch sides, uh, it's an important moment because that happened subsequent to that. Exactly the same thing happened in East Germany and exactly the same thing happened in Russia. When, uh, when, when Boris Yeltsin uh, came to power, when, because, because uh, Gorbachev was overthrown by a military coup, and then Yeltsin sort of got the, got the army to support his popular uprising, so the army came over. So uh, this is an important thing for us to watch yeah. in our current scenario. See where the in our current scenario. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that's it. Then there's one more operation I just want to talk about, and then, uh, then, I'll, then I'll keep quiet. And that operation was now that we back in South Africa, and South Africa is burning, early 1990s. South Africa is burning. Mkonto Wesizwe is nowhere to be seen. And 
an SAD of Special Forces Operation, Operation Merriam, comes home. The gogos come home to roost. The chickens come home to roost. And Operation Marion was uh, up at up at Buffalo Base. I think it was. I think it was Buffalo. I don't know. Fort Doppies. I don't know one of those. But but there was uh, a couple of I think 200 Zulu MPs were were trained by our special forces, and they eventually gave rise to the Roy Duca in the townships of the 1980s. And those same, those same, same thing also metastasized. It also grew and grew and grew, and the uh, special forces lost control of it. They lost control of it. Put up on red. Special forces lost control of the ultimate result of Marion. And what started happening now was the CCB had been formed. D40 that I, earned, uh, that I spoke about earlier on involved in that whole CCB, early stage of CCB. Mm -hmm. CCB now became a criminal entity, a criminal entity, extrajudicial killing, flood plus, yeah. all that stuff was extra extrajudicial. Yeah. And within NI, we were, we were very clear, we had a very clear line in the set. We believed in constitutional reform. We, we believed in the, in the rule of law. So we were not in any way supportive of extrajudicial killing, none. So, we were then starting to work on this whole problem of how to, how to protect this Cadessa thing, how to, how to get the Cadessa thing going. And Cadessa had been brought under grave threat by a thing called the Boipetong Massacre, the Kwamakuta Massacre, the Trust Fees Massacre, and this was old Operation Marion people coming out to roost now. And they were now derailing the process. And in the midst of this was a man called Eugene de Kock. And Eugene de Kock was now bringing in weapons from Mozambique. Mozambique had this festering civil war. And a decision was made to insert a small team into Mozambique to go and, to go and develop the intelligence background of what's going on there. What's going on? We've got to stop the flow of weapons. South African government had signed the Incomati Peace Accords, and the Incomati Peace Accords committed both governments, South Africa and Mozambique, to, to work peacefully for a peaceful resolution to their conflicts. But more importantly, the Incomati Peace Accords said that the, in Mozambique, the Mozambicans are not allowed to arm, arm the uh, 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 comrades from, from the liberation movement. And, 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 and but then South Africa must break off its ties with Renamo. And there were deep connections between Special Forces and Renamo. And this was a very tricky, very, very tricky operation. So decision was made to put a to put a small team into that into that space. And I was one of those two guys. It was a two man team put in. Two man team. There was a third guy, but he was he he, he stayed out of the country. He he only came in much later on once we'd established the the whole, the whole process. And that was probably one of the most difficult operations I've ever run in my life. It was a deep penetration operation without any support from those. It lasted ultimately a period of 18 months. So, so you know, when Didis and these guys were doing their, their, their small teams operation along the railway line, that was like, like, like a month or two, you know, that was, their, 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 that was a, a serious operation, but that, that's, that's their time span. We had to develop the capacity to do it much longer and without any support whatsoever from, from, from home. So this, uh, this particular operation was known as Bush Talk. Operation Bush Talk was a uh, um, very, very, very difficult operation because we were up against the likes of Colonel Eugene de Kock. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, 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 we started developing the intelligence background. And I, can, I can speak for hours just on that operation. But, what we needed to know now was, is Ramama involved in, 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 in supplying weapons? Where are the weapons coming from? Are the Americans involved? Are they, whatever, who's involved? Okay. So we started developing this, uh, this, uh, this foundation. And, uh, and part of it was uh, we used uh, our good old methods. We, we, we got into the communication line. And we found out at the time that Ramama had uh, very poor communications. And uh, they... Uh, we heard that they wanted to improve their communications, so we said, we'll help you improve your communications. And we, we improved their communications for them. And we did what we did always. 
uh, we gave them sophisticated computers with hard drives and we did what we always did, we had a cache in there. So everything they ever wrote and everything they ever did was cached and we would, we would pick it up and give it to So we, we, did a, we did a standard, this is, this is our fingerprint, this is how we operate it. And uh, we gave them all the comms that they needed. For, uh, so they gave them mobile comms wherever they wanted to go and we could, we could, we could crack that whole thing. But nonetheless, um, we, in that operation, Operation uh, um, um, Bush Talk it was called, I think was probably one of the most significant operations that we had from a small team's perspective because we sustained it for so long. We had absolutely no support from base whatsoever. So if any of us were compromised in the field, we had to escape and evade on our own. We could not call in the SAF to lift us out. We could not do no hot extraction that was possible. Uh, so we had an escape and evasion uh, 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 process. Uh, we had to, we were based up in the middle of Mo Mozambique, uh, uh, Gorongosa, uh, Maringwe area. And uh, we had to make our way on foot to Malawi. We had to, we had, we had, we had a, a, a move, uh, move by night and uh, holler, holler up in the day and make our way to Malawi if we had to get extracted. Uh, that, that, that is it, we, had to, we, could, we couldn't do anything else. And uh, part of the thing is we had to send radio comms back every single day. My son was the uh, youngest radio hand in the country at the time, and uh, I got uh, I got uh, permission from Lakamas people because I set up all of their radio comms for them, and I got permission from them that I could chat to my son every morning, and they could they could listen to me talking to my son, and uh, and, and our people picked up that comms as a, li as a sign of life that we were alive. So uh, there was never any sort of traffic through that communication, just just you know me talking to father, the son, the sign of life, and. Um, and uh, through that process, we managed to develop a deep understanding of, of, of what was needed to, to end the civil war in Mozambique. The Mozambican civil war, the ending of that civil war, was, uh, was based on the intelligence that, that we started. We, we, were, we were the, the sort of first one, you know, we were the advanced party of what became a very sophisticated thing later on because it eventually expanded out to the SAP. The South African police and the Mozambican police, they, they, they went on a command operation and they started lifting up caches of weapons by, by, by the thousands, thousands and thousands of RPGs and you name it, uh, thousands and thousands of these things were lifted up by that, by that. but we did that initial, that initial uh, intelligence work. And I would just like to say that I'm, 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 I'm deeply proud of what we did as South Africans. I hold my head high. We were as good as the Israelis, as good as the best of the British, as good as the best of the Americans, as good as the best of the French. We were, we were up there in that space. We were never vinchat, we, we were never bragged about it. In fact, I'm probably one of the few people from that space that talks about those things. I made a conscious decision uh, after, after the being so deeply involved in our transition to democracy, I made a conscious decision that I'm not going to allow myself to be held hostage for the rest of my life to the secrecy of the time. I'm conscious of the fact that if we don't talk about our historic past, we're going to allow other people to write it for us and they're going to vilify and demonize us. I don't have any regrets for anything that I've done. Don't have any regrets whatsoever. I, 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 I don't want to say I speak on behalf of other faceless people, but, but, I, but, I, but I do actually speak on their behalf because when I had a very difficult experience with my daughter, when my daughter turned 18, at that point in time the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was starting and very few people knew that I was involved in, in, in NI, very few people, but in our family one or two people knew about it. And now the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was starting to talk, you know, and the whole thing is happening now. And a guy called Dirk Kutsia was up, Captain Dirk Kutsia. And this was making news every, every day in the headlines. And we were at some family function. And someone mentioned to my daughter, oh, but your dad was also involved. And this, Traumatized my daughter. Traumatized there's something no end. Because we had 
my, my, my wife and I had made a conscious decision to keep our daughter out of this. Our son knew that I was involved and we felt guilty that, uh, that, that we burdened my son by being the guy that I had to talk to every morning during bush talk. Uh, we, felt, we felt that we burdened this kid unnecessarily, so we made a conscious decision to not, to not tell our daughter. So our daughter was kept in total ignorance. And no, she just never thought to ask, Dad, what do you do for a living? She just didn't ask that. And suddenly at the age of 18, she was shocked now to hear that her father was maybe like Doug, like Doug Kutsia, who had murdered people and then had a bra while they were burning their bodies. Yeah. And it was a horrifying experience for my daughter. And in that instant, I made a decision. And I made a decision to write a book. And I wrote this book here. And I wrote this book in the front of this book, I dedicated this book for my children, that they may know what their father was doing while he was not always there. When they were growing up, surrounded by secrecy in a land divided. And I decided I'm going to hold myself accountable to my family by telling them my story. Not, this, not the story of them, my story. Yes. And I've told you a little bit of my story today. And in, in telling that story, I felt an enormous sense of catharsis, a sense of relief, because I'd broken the, the, the rule of secrecy. And that rule was that you never talk about it. And I said, but, but if you never talk about it, no one's going to ever know about it. And therefore, they're going to assume that, oh, you're such evil bastards that you did these terrible things. I'm proud of the fact that I was involved in the penetration of those bombing operations. I'm proud of the fact that we could stop those bombing operations. I'm proud of that fact. I'm proud of the fact that we could get involved ultimately in the, in the bringing to justice of Helena Pasteur's the bomber. Right now, I'm speaking to journalists from Europe. They're doing a thing on Klaus de Jonge. He's holed up. He was holed up in the, in the, in the embassy. And they're talking to me because, because I'm now known. So now they're talking to me about the, the, the Lyon affair. So we're talking about these things are being opened up now. I'm just busy talking to a French journalist right now about the Dulce September incident. They want to know about what happened in Dulce September. And we weren't involved in that stuff, but I can give context about what happened there at that point in time. And I'm talking to some Swedish people, some Norwegian people. They want to know about Olive Palmer, what happened to the assassination of Olive Palmer. So this is like almost like a catharsis because suddenly now I've got nothing to hide. Yeah. Put me under a polygraph, put me under cross-examination in a court of law under oath. I can tell the truth. I've, yeah. told the truth. I've told you the truth. I've told you the truth. And Anthony, sorry, just as a matter of interest, has there been any backlash? The, okay, so so when I when I wrote this thing, uh, the first thing that I wrote, I was going to get it. So after this, Dirk could see a shock that my daughter received. I decided that I'm going to write to my the story, and I did this. I wrote this thing, and I only produced eight copies of this. Okay. And coming from a classified environment, you'll know that any classified document, a highly classified document, will tell you on the top, top secret copy number one of ten copies or number copy number three of seven copies or whatever and then at the bottom you've got a distribution list of who the copies are sent to. So I decided to make eight copies of this book available in a classified form. Uh, copy one for my mother, copy two for my sister, copy three for my brother, copy four for my wife, I forget the exact order of them now, and then to my, to my son, to my daughter, and then one copy, for copy number eight for my lawyer. <laughs> in case I was going to be bombed up, okay? And then members of my unit got to hear about that. And they said, but do you realize that by having done this, you've actually written some of our history as well? I said, I hadn't thought of it like that because I'd only written my story. And they said, no, we want you to tell our story. So I was mandated by them to tell part of their story. In, a, in an SCI environment, I don't know what their full story is because I still don't know. Sure. I, still, I still don't know those days what their, their real names are. Something else. I still don't know. But I told their story as best I can, and then I brought this thing out as a second version, a hundred copies, a hundred copies for them. And then something happened. I was accosted on national television by a former member of Mkonto Isiswe. I was invited to a program of Dennis Beckett, Beckett's Trick, 
Okay. And we were talking about something completely different. But water. I'm a water man. Talking about water. And on this, uh, it was at Rao University. And at this Dennis Beckett's thing, with television cameras running, this, this, this MK guy is walking up and down the stage, talking about water, and he pivots on his heel, and he says, he points at me, he says, this man you can't trust. This man was a member of military intelligence. And he goes now on national television and blurts out the fact that I am a member of military intelligence and cannot be trusted. Therefore, I'm like all these, you know, the, you know, the, the dead could see us in the world. And that was a shocking experience because firstly, I was never ever a member of military intelligence. I was a member of national, national intelligence, intelligence yeah. which is not military intelligence. So it was factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he had defamed me. He had defamed me on national television. And he had now prevented me as a professional from, from earning a living by defaming me on national television. And because I'm a highly trained ex-special operations guy, we, we retaliate with maximum controlled, focused aggression. Controlled, focused aggression, no collateral damage. And I hired the smartest lawyer that I could find. And we decided to hit this guy for defamation. And it formed a part of a big, big legal action that I was involved in at that point in time. And I won my cases. I won my cases, out of court settlements. In all cases, I won them out of court settlements. And at that point in time, I was then advised that this person has said this about you, tell your story. So I then took the text, this text here, I took that text there and, and I turned it into, it into that there. Okay. <laughs> and I just uh, I just updated a little bit and that, and that was made publicly available, shaking hands with Billy. And from that moment onwards, I felt, I just felt this greatest sense of relief. Uh, and in fact, I gave copies to the State Security Agency. I gave copies to uh, senior intelligence people. I gave copies to uh, you know, ministers, etc. I never had any, any, any pushback to this day. In fact, uh, um, I would say I've still got a, a cordial relationship with all of those people to this day because I've always believed that facts are our friends. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, 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 knowledge and honesty sets you free. Integrity sets you free. If we did what we did, how can we be expected? How can you send a car bomber into your capital city yeah. to go and detonate a device and maim and injure and kill many, many people. In fact, in that process, I learned this one wonderful Air Force officer, his name I can't recall now, he was blinded in that process. And that man holds no grudge. He holds no grudge. Yeah. And if you talk to him today, he'll tell you that he felt liberated because having lost his sight, he can now do things that other people can't do. He can now apply his skills to something else. These are people of integrity. This is part of what, what, what I refer to as the era of excellence. We did the things that were right. We did the things that were just. And how can I not be proud of that? So I'll just wrap up by saying that for my sins, I was made a founding member of the South African Secret Service. Um, Nelson Mandela was the president at the time. I was promoted into a senior position. And in that senior promotion, it was, it was of such a level of seniority that it had to be approved by the presidency. So I served as a staff officer in what was then the new COVID operations which is not what the current COVID operation, because it's been totally bastardized now, totally, totally ripped out and it's been completely destroyed and criminalized, uh, yeah. totally criminalized. So I served in that role in, uh, as, as a staff officer, uh, uh, up to a point where I just felt it was untenable for me anymore to, to serve. But, uh, but I served on great sides of the divide. I've served under, under four different presidents. Uh, I've served uh, two so-called apartheid presidents 
and two, uh, two uh, 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 civilian prisons. And uh, I've, uh, I've served with dignity, with integrity. I've never ever done, I've never committed a crime. And uh, I, would, I would redo anything that we've ever done again. Bottom line is this. We have in South Africa a world-class special operations capability, deep penetration capability, a very few services in the world could, would, even, they would even think about deploying such a small force on such a mission as we did in South Africa on a routine basis. And my story is not a remarkable story because it's, it's simply a story of, of others like me. There were others like me that did exactly the same thing. So I'm not in any way trying to, trying to sort of you know, say that I'm, I'm different or I'm special, not at all. I'm trying to draw attention to the fact here that South Africa is a remarkable country. And I'm going to just close it by saying now, I know of no country in the world where a sitting government voluntarily relinquished its power in the interests of averting a civil war. Now we can criticize that today, but nonetheless, that was done then. I know of no government that had a military capability with weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, and nuclear that voluntarily relinquished us in the interests of peace. I know of no country in the world where a prisoner of conscience looked at his jailer and said, you, as my jailer, are as much a victim of the system as I am. I know of nowhere else in the world where in an attempt to reconcile, we brought victim and perpetrator together to face each other, to, to, to be accountable, to, for justice to be done, for justice to be seen to be done. Mm -hmm. I think these are remarkable achievements. And today, you've come here through difficult times, you've come here through maybe through a roadblock or two, I don't know, but you came here, you arrived here, you arrived here. And today, while the FF is trying to shut the country down, people of integrity are carrying on. People of integrity are trying to build a country, are trying to build a democracy. And this is what I belong to. This is what I'm proud of. So that's it. We come from an era of excellence. We did the right thing. We did good things, wholesome things, things that I'm proud of, things that I would I like to think my children will be proud of. So that's why I dedicate that book to my brothers and sisters uh, in, in, in COVID operations, Chief Director of COVID operations of the National Intelligence Service. We had a motto, ad obscura in a pattern, from darkness into the light. And I see this, what I'm doing today, as part of that process of bringing something from the darkness into the light. And I thank you very much for giving me the platform to do this. I'm very active. And because I happen to have a fairly high media profile, I, I, wherever, I, wherever I can, I sort of try and, try and to bring those things together. And I'm, I'm particularly active in 6-1 Riders. And um, what we try and do there is we try, with a single-minded mission, we try and dignify the role of the conscripted soldier through, through recognition. So that's it. Dignify the role of the conscripted soldier through recognition. And I think what makes 6-1 such a remarkable organization is that of all the other things, you know, all your special force organizations that have done remarkable things, also world-class entities, even national intelligence, you know, the remarkable stuff. They were professionals. That's a career that you did. 6-1 yeah. was the only combat unit that I'm aware of. There was maybe 101, and I, so there were others. But, yeah. but nonetheless, 6-1 was a remarkable combat unit because it was so deeply and profoundly involved in, 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 in cross-border, hostile cross-border op operations yeah. with a relatively high success rate. There were casualties. You're an example yeah, yeah. of a casualty. There were obviously casualties involved. You can't do this kind of thing without yeah. casualties. But I think with a remarkable success rate, and uh, you must remember that a conscripted soldier is not a specially selected or yeah. you know, a person. So they, 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 they will have all kinds of issues for the rest of their life. This is, yeah. you know, this is uh, what we've got to look after. So I'm very, very pr you know, pr uh, proud to be involved in that. Even though of the 6-1 guys, my 6-1 my story is probably the least remarkable of them all. I, uh, I was there for, for uh, a week. I was there, deployed there for one, 
for one for one for one, uh, one reason alone, yeah. and then uh, I, I happen to have also been in uh, in Zangongo uh, uh, during uh, during uh, Mebos when the chopper was shot down, and um, and uh, you know we were put on standby as a, as a, a possible reserve force, but then Bravo Company under Roland de Fris, they yeah. were they were close by, and then they went and they did the this Jasper Kluter, Jasper Jasper. If you interview Jasper, Jasper was in that in that recovery. Yeah, yeah. So 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 my involvement with with Six One was peripheral. However, having said that, I've been made to feel extremely at home in Six One. It was uh, uh, General Rally. He, he made me feel very very yeah. comfortable. And in fact, he said I must come and talk to uh, to to uh, Ariel Ariel Hicho. Uh, and Ari made me very welcome. He said, "Listen, this is a broad church. He said, yeah. it's a broad church. It's, you know, it's, uh, if you serve there for a day off, what does make a difference? Yeah. You, know, you were there. You were there. You were, uh, if you were a chef, if you were this, does make a difference. That's what you are. So I'm very proud of that thing, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, I think Six One is a remarkable organisation in the sense that it has become so broadly based. And you saw it this weekend. Yeah, you yeah. saw it this weekend uh, how they linked up with Kufut, how they linked yeah, up yeah, with uh, yeah. the Special Forces Association. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in KZN particularly, so there's deep, deep, deep uh, relationships yeah, yeah. with a whole lot of other entities. So I think Six One MVA is very healthy. It must continue to doing what it's doing, and I think Six One Riders also has got a very important role to play. It's uh, it will continue to grow and continue to do what it just yeah. yeah, we we also think that that. I believe Sikh uh, One. Uh, no, we started uh, um, in Bloemfontein, all the smoke show guys. Yeah. It was since they first started, I think a year after smoke show, started to get together as a few guys and then it started growing and I, I really think uh, Sikh One happening as they saw Bloemfontein guys can get on a, a Thursday 80, 90 people together every, every month. So, uh, yes, it was in 2014, I think we started. So yeah, sequence is for me is a, a, a brotherhood and for me it's a release valve. Yeah. Uh, they never, uh, uh, I think a sequence guy would never leave a another guy bound yeah, yeah. and so Andrew and his team and that legacy is I think it's a thing for the future because there's a lot of guys to have they must t tell their stories yeah. and yeah yeah you know for, for me for me six one neck has done a very very important thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something now that I've never said before in, in, in public okay um, being a, a small teams guy, yes, I was a professional. I'm not a hairy chested man of action and I'm not made of stainless steel. Mm. And one of the things that, that happens on these small teams um, missions is that you're very lonely and you're very, you can't trust anybody. Mm. And uh, one becomes quite distrustful and quite traumatized, I would think so. I've come to, to realize that I, in fact, suffer from quite bad PTSD. Mm. And in fact, I've come to become, I, 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 because I'm interested in this, these things, I learn about them and I've come, I think I'm, I'm a reasonable uh, expert on PTSD today. Mm. I, I don't want to brag about it, but I, I think mm. I know. And the reason why I say that is because my father was an 18 year old gunner at the Battle of Al Alamayla. Mm. And he came back with PTSD. So I've grown up in the shadow yeah. of PTSD. Mm. And I always try to understand PTSD. And what I've now come to realize is that coming from a deep covert secretive background, the sickness of that background is you can never heal. No. You can never you can never talk to your brother. You can't have a have a campfire talk to hey, do you remember this? Do you remember I picked this and this? You can't talk about that. And that's what's important to me. Okay, so I suffer from PTSD. I'm I'm up every morning at two, three o'clock in the morning, I can't sleep. I've learned that the, the demon in my head. I just I can't control it, so I control it by waking up, and I control it by by rationalizing. Mm. So I wake up at two three in the morning, and then I do some writing and I do some stuff. I do about mm. two hours of work every night between two three o'clock four o'clock in the morning. I do some really good quality work, then I go back to sleep again. Mm. And that's how I've learned how to control my demons. And and the demon that I have in my head, I've got I've got a couple of demons that keep on keep on hitting me. And the one demon is I'm being hunted. 
I'm hunted. I'm being hunted like a dog. I'm being hunted, hunted, hunted relentlessly. And they onto me. They onto me. And they, it's, they, I, I, it's, it's this escape and evasion thing from Mozambique. But, mm. but you know, this thing in Russia. Mm. I came out of I came out of uh, out of uh, GDR. Mm. I had lost twenty kilograms in weight. Mm. I was emaciated. I was I was I was uh, yeah yeah I was I was jumpy. I was jumpy. I was jumpy. You could never ever switch off. And I've subsequently come to learn that this is a, this is a condition known as hypervigilance. Mm. And hypervigilance, you never ever your brain never switches off, and because your brain doesn't switch off, you burn up eventually. So I've come to learn that this is part of my PTSD. This is part of my. Uh, this is what I burn up with, and I've learned to. Uh, I've learned now that there's a that there's a, a rational and irrational part of your brain. This thing functions in the irrational mind, in the irrational mind when you're half awake and half asleep. So I can't be half awake and half asleep. I must be either fully asleep or fully awake. I can't be in that in that middle period. And so we, so when it happens, I just wake up. Uh, I, I physically go into my rational mind. Get that in control again. I do what I have to do. I just I lament the fact that I will never sleep a, a good night again. So what? But mm. this guy, I'm being hunted, hunted, hunted. And when they catch me, they're going to do the most terrible things imaginable to me. And I, I can, I can, I can. I'll just tell you two stories about that. I'll just give you two stories about that. So the one story about that was I was swapped at some point in time. Mm. So I was in Europe. I was in Europe on mission. And I was living in a in a flat on the fifth fourth, fourth, fourth or fifth floor. Of the, I can't remember, but fourth or fifth floor of this block of flats. And we selected this block of flats carefully because you couldn't get access to the front door. You had the, uh, uh, access control happened down at the at the entrance foyer, and and uh, uh, you had to be let in, otherwise you couldn't come to the front. So it was considered by us to be secure. I'm living alone under an assumed identity. And I'm at my most vulnerable when I've got my crypto out now. And I'm now busy, I'm busy writing a, an encrypted communication. I'm busy reporting back on this, mm. on this, uh, on the stuff that I'm telling you about now. This, uh, this uh, uh, Romanian thing. I'm, I'm reporting now in detail on what I'm seeing now, etc. I'm, I'm, I'm working with crypto, and there I get on my front door. <laughs> what now? Mm. So I live my cryptos, there's all wires and this and that, and now, oh, you know, in those days we used acoustic modems. So uh, you know, acoustic modems and this and that all lying out there. So I, I, I can't touch that. I go and look at the front door, and I go, there's no haiki in the door. And I look through the haiki, and there's a man in uniform. I don't know. There's a man in uniform at my door, and he shouldn't be there. What do I do? So I go back, and I decide I'm going to. I can't. I, I mean, I, 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 I can't jump out of the out of the, out of the building. With, I, I can't, I'm stuck. I'm in this. I'm in this building. All I can do is I can hide this crypto stuff under a blanket, and I can open the door and just be normal. Mm. But my mind is racing. My mind is racing. Now this is an unbeaten bust. Now this I'm going to. Um, this is the. So I open the door and I speak in my, my best foreign language. Good evening to you. Can I help you? And he says to me, Yes, he's. Uh, He's from the fire brigade, and he's collecting money for the widows and orphans fund. Will, will, I, will I be prepared to make a donation? I said, only a pleasure. And I, you know, very cool, calm sort of thing. I, and I just held out some money, and I, I claimed it all back from, from, from national intelligence, but I, I, I gave the widow, and I said, please give me a receipt. I want the receipt, okay, and I can claim it back. But that, in that moment, you know, the, 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 you're living on the edge all the time. You're just living in, in that space on your own, completely on your own, you can't trust anybody. So that was the one thing. But the second thing that, that happened was a, was a very brutal, brutal thing. I'm going to tell you the story now. It's got a little, little bit of a long story, but I'm telling you the story now. So in Bushtuk, we're now penetrating into Ranama. Penetrating. Special forces are there. They're not necessarily our friends. Mm. The special forces think that we've gone soft on communists. Uh, Captain, uh, Colonel the, Eugene de Kock has got an order to take out own forces that have gone soft on communists. He told me so himself. He told me himself. So here we are, living in, 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 in this place. And we're living in a, in a, in a, in those days we're living in a tent. And we were kept away from the normal activities of the normal forces. But you could hear them every morning doing PT and what have you. And one day, just one day, the two of us, the two-man team, gets invited to attend a, uh, a parade function. 
So we're attending a parade function here. Unusual. This is unusual. This is this is this is not a normal activity. And look at my 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 my, my buddy, he looks at me. Okay. So I don't know what's going on. Next thing they pull out someone, they time to a tree in front of us, and they put out a tocker leaf and they put a bullet in his head. Boom! Man down. What now? What, what do you do? You can't panic, you can't so you've been invited to witness this event. So what, what, what must I do? I'm not going to be horrified, I'm not going to be shocked, I'm just going to be deadpan and that your mind is racing, your mind is racing, your mind is racing. So my colleague speaks preferred Portuguese, says to them, what's happened? And they said, no, there's been a leakage of information from the office of the president. But that's what we do. That's what we do. <laughs> so, okay. So my colleague says, did he do it? No, he didn't do it. So why did you shoot him? To prevent those people who've got these things in their mind to think about it. So now you think, okay, okay. This is where we're living. We're living in that pressure cooker. We're living in that pressure mm -hmm. cooker. And the stuff's happening there. And there's famine in the country. And there's ex special forces guys out there that are highly capable people. And they don't necessarily think that we're good guys. They think that we might be hostile to their interests. And there's arms dealers happening in the background. And there's elephant trafficking. And there's drug trafficking. And there's stolen cars happening in the background. And we in this whole Thing. And then there's the Americans and the French and the British and they out there. That's it's, it's a believe me, it's a it's a hamos. Mm -hmm. This is a hamos of a place, and we're there on our own. We're on our own. Okay. So the decision is now made that the team must get split up. I don't know why, but they made the decision. So they split the team up. So now now we we're in isolation. I'm in isolation and my partners in isolation. Okay, so what? I'm there as a radio engineer. I'm providing their radio comms. So I'm ready to do my inside. Every night I would I would close up my tent flap and I would I would zigzag the tent flap closed in a certain way, tie all not there, go to bed. Sleep for a long time because um, there's no, no electricity, no, no no alcohol allowed there, nothing. And so you've got long, long hours of you know it's, your, your 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 time is determined by the sun up and down, that's what it's. And I go to sleep and I wake up to the sound of my, of my tent flap. There's this noise at my tent flap. Something's trying to get into my tent flap. Ah, making noise. Mm. You know, with the way I tie the knot, they can't get the knot. Ah, what now? Ah, my head's racing, my head's racing. Same, same thing now. I, I mean, my tent is this thick, and they're gonna get in if they wanna get in. So I open up, what does a normal guy do? So normal, how do I open up, and there's two Ranama soldiers. And it's fixed. On the eight case. And they said to me, Are you are you they, they, they gave me they gave me a code name. Are you uh, are you are you uh, are you this person? So I said, Yes, I am. I said, come with. Where to come with? Now we came through the bushes. We were kept in a small part of this very big camp. This camp was 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 sometimes under attack by the uh, by the Mozambican Air Force. Mm. So the tank, the, 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 the camp was in a deep forest under massive trees, and you never walked out from under those trees. You never, they always hid under those trees. And this, when I say this camp was massive, it was kilometers across for this reason, because of the air, 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 air bombardments, etc. And we were isolated in a small part of this camp where we had to do our work with the radios and whatever. And now suddenly we are being broken out of my perimeter, and, and, and I don't know why. But it's night time. Why would they break me out of my perimeter at night time? And I'll never forget that night. The moon was a full moon that night. And the moon was so bright, so bright, like a silvery colored thing. I remember my time in, 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 in Angola, the same thing, with the silvery moon. Mm. I, I said, I had this flashback of that moment in time. And I said, okay, I'm now between two armed guards, one before me, one behind me knowing not the slightest clue where I'm going. No one knows I'm in this country at the moment in time. If they are going to take me out tonight, no one's going to even know that I'm dead. 
accept my family will eventually learn, but there will be no, 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 no fuss made about this thing. So now, you walk, you walk, you now, so now your mind starts going, okay, what, what's going on now, what's going on now? Have I been compromised? Have I been compromised? And start thinking about, okay, we separated, from my, myself and my buddy, we separated, so uh, have, they, have they done the same to him? Because what they would do now, they would capture both of us, and then they start interrogating us, and then you start comparing this story to that story, and that story to this story. And as soon as the story is no longer tied up, then you start, you know, you start to, that's how interrogation works. So I'm just going through my story now, the Greek story, that uh, this is what I am, this is what I'm doing here, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's all mistaken, blah, 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 blah. And as we go through the bush, um, I, I, I start getting calm, 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 calm. I, I've always felt an enormous calm under those circumstances. Although there's one part of your head that's just that's just seething. Mm -hmm. But I've always managed to compartment that. And this is this PTSD thing that comes up now. That, mm -hmm. that compartmented part is still there. But, I, but that's that's going that's, that's that's going mad. But okay, so what's going to happen now? And I remember thinking, I hope I don't beg for mercy. And I hope I don't cry. That, that, that's the thoughts mm -hmm. going on. I hope I don't. I hope I don't beg for mercy because they're going to video me begging for mercy. Mm -hmm. Where they're going to. Uh, I hope I don't break down in some emotional mm -hmm. outburst. I hope I don't do that. So I'm preparing myself now for this possible. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to put a bullet in my head now. And we're walking out. I don't know how long we walked for, but it was it was a fair distance. I would say we probably walked for 20 minutes to maybe half an hour mm -hmm. through the bush. And as we walked, I started getting more and more calm as we going along. And going through this, this, this little, this little uh, 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 animal trails in the bushes, mm -hmm. walking along those animal trails. And slowly I started hearing in the, in the distance, I hear this sound, like a, like a, like a purring sound. Mm -hmm. And then as I get closer, it gets louder and louder and louder. It's a generator. There's a generator in the bush. Mm -hmm. I'm going towards a place with a generator. Okay, what now? So this is the headquarters. This is the headquarters place. This is now. This is uh, now. This is. Uh, we're getting close now to my end destination. So we get there, and there's this hut. And the guards deliver me to the hut. Very unfriendly guys. They wouldn't talk to me. They just didn't. They, they, their job was to deliver me. They didn't know anything else about. So I go into the hut, and there's the light. So the lights on inside this. You know, the generators under this light, and my eyes are like my my eyes clean. And I look at this guy and it's a clock. Now we used to we used to work with the clocks because the clocks in Mozambique, because of the high rate of ir illiteracy, if you could read and write, you were an important guy. So we worked with the clocks because the clocks were what we wanted to recruit. We would give them a computer and then they would write stuff and we'd be able to read what they were writing. So I knew this clock. And I, I said I said to him, yes, you know. What's happening? You know, the, the guys came to call me. You know, what, what's going on? And he looks at me. He says, "You radio engineer." I said, "My best put yes, see, see, I'm radio engineer." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, "Can we fix that thing?" And he points towards a photocopy machine. Now, what I hate is photocopy machines. And I said, "No, <laughs> not a problem. I can fix anything. You give it to me. I'll do it." Okay? So I opened up this photocopy machine. This is what they called me out for. The photocopy machine was broken. So yeah, I open up this photocopy machine, and inside the, the, the photocopy machine is this high tension, high voltage wire, mm. and there's this big, big spinnacle, but that big spa, big mother like this size, and he's mm. gone in there and he's, he's got electrocuted under the wire, so he shorted out this wire. Mm. So I clear the spinnacle out there, and I clean out this thing, I put it there, push the button, test, and it works. I said, yeah, sort it out, you know, I'm happy, he's happy, you know. Mm. And that night, I tell you, that that night, just the, the things that go through your mind, you know, it's just the constant, the constant tensions. And, uh, and uh, you know, they eventually delivered me back to my tent. But uh, there, 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 was, there was another story, just another little funny little story about this. The same operator. Bit of, uh, you know, guys have got different personality profiles. And I'm a very, I'm a very stickler for doing it, doing the right things. You know, I must do the right things by And I'm very, I, I like to follow a procedure. I like to cut no corners when you're doing this kind of thing. No, cut no corners. Make sure that everything is right. Now, this guy was a bit of a, he was a very good operator. An ex-veteran uh, from uh, Ascari. He was actually injured, severely injured, severely wounded in Ascari. This guy. But uh, nonetheless, an, an exceptionally good operator. But a little bit on the on the sort of t no, he would t he would cut corners sometimes, mm. and I didn't like that. So be because when you're operating like that, you've got a couple of things you've got to have with you. The one thing you've got to have, you've got to have your medical kit. You've got to have a big medical kit because you're on your own. You, know, you do your own medical stuff. 
So you can't walk in there now as a radio engineer with a big medical kit. So you've got to cash that thing away. You've got to hide it away. Mm -hmm. And the people must know you've got a medical kit. Then you've got to have a lot of money. Could have used dollars. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got to do escape and evasion, you've got to have bucks in your pocket. So mm -hmm. we had a cash established. And nobody knew where that cash was, just the two of us. Now, from the county espionage perspective, if you want to catch cars spice, you go to their cash. And you, and you see if they, you know the cash is there, or do they come to the cash now? That's evidence. So one day I'm sitting there and I'm telling you, I'm talking to this guy. And I said to him, listen, but that money that you got, the dollars that we got, did you check between the dollars that there's no receipt in there? There's no stamp that says National Intelligence Service. No, I didn't. I said, but we want to go and do that. Now we've got to go and lift the cash and you've got to go and check this thing. Now we plan, we plan. We made a decision, we never do anything spontaneously out there. You never ever, mm -hmm. when you're in isolation like that, your mind starts playing tricks on you. So we made a decision that any decision like that will always be a joint decision. So we always kind of you know, balance each other's uh, perception because your mind starts playing tricks on you. So we, started, we, we made a decision that we're going to lift the cash. It's a high risk mission to lift the cash. Mm -hmm. Therefore, one person's going to do it. And we're going to go and check, going to go, and go through the notes again and just check that there's nothing in there, nothing from, from anything that says National Intelligence Service. Should have been done before we left. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I was, I, was, I was very angry with him that this happened. I was very angry. I was his senior. And I, and I very, you know, we, we, we operate in a flat structure. But nonetheless, I, I, was, I was letting him rip. But you can't do that because you break up the team now. And you, so, you know, you, you, it's, it's difficult you know, to, to uh, those signals. Anyhow, long story short, he, he goes to lift the cash. And he comes back. He's done, yeah. He said, all sorts of guys, officer. Did you find anything? Yes. <laughs> you found receipts. So I said, are you sure you got all of them now? He says, yeah, got sure got all of them. He says, right, now we're going to get rid of these receipts now. But now remember that we were there living in the bush during a war where the, where the, where, 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 where the Frelimo forces had air superiority. And they were constantly looking for stuff down in the bushes. And they would come and strafe. They would just come with their, with their gunships and they would shoot. So you never make a fire there. You never make a fire there. So now we make a decision. We've got to get rid of this, this, this paperwork now. So what, what we should do is tear it up and eat it. So we decide we're going to tear up this paperwork in the tiniest, tiniest pieces possible that you can't put them back together. We're going to break it up into different little parts and we can't get rid of it. And we're going to go and throw this down the long drop toilet. There's a long drop toilet where we are. We're going to go and put this down the long drop toilet. Right, so we do that now. No, it's a plan. That's the plan. Right. Good plan. I don't have to be prepared. It's a plan. Next thing, he goes along. He, he disposes of his lot. I dispose of my lot. We separate them so they, you know, they can't be put together. Come back, and there I start seeing billowing smoke coming out of the toilet. But billowing smoke. And the smoke is getting blacker and blacker and bigger and bigger. <laughs> And I said, what now? What the hell happened? I know he, he decided he, just to make sure he's going to burn it. <laughs> so he dropped a burning piece of paper into a long drop toilet where methane gas is produced by, by decomposing feces. And he ignited spontaneously a fire that started burning with a ferocity that, uh, the likes of which I haven't seen before. So now the two of us go into this fire. Now the, the only thing we have available is our urine. So we're now trying to urinate this fire dead. And we, all the urine we can produce doesn't make a difference. The fire is going, it's just going, it's going. Now we're concerned, because now the, something's going to happen, okay? Anyhow, long story short, people started milling around and eventually we got some water and eventually we put this thing out. But this is the kind of thing that goes wrong. It's the small things like that that go wrong. Now, you know, I was very, very angry with this guy because had we followed procedure, had we gone through what we call pocket litter, pocket litter, before you leave, before you leave, you check these things out, you know. So I, I, I reprimanded him severely. And I don't want to do a, a reprimand in the field because then you break up mor morale. You don't want to do that. You, know? you don't want to do that, okay. But anyway, I, just, I had to do it. You know? I'd say, guys, this is just not acceptable, you know. This is a serious mission we're on. This is, this is not Mickey Mouse stuff. Playing. But the point I want to make is that those, that's the life we lived. And that was in your conscience the whole time. And that's still not out of my mind. To this, to this day, you know, mm -hmm. 2 o'clock in the morning, that's still in my mind. And, and what I'm grateful to 6-1 MVA for is that 
we've got these Skoa Skira, and I'm grateful to the Anton Mullers of the world, and I'm grateful to you know, this, this, the, the, the 618 MVA KZN guy. These are all remarkable people. We, we have our time at Kwahumbi, and we, we go on these, uh, these weekend Skoa Skira, and we make a campfire, and we talk to each other, and we tell each other stories, and we look after each other, and that's it. So sorry, it's my long winded story. I told you I can talk. <laughs> Cohen, he was, he was Bill Clinton's secretary for defense. Okay. So, yeah. Some interesting times and places there. And then, and then this year I was... He's... Yeah, here is, here is a Tabo Becky. There's Tabo Becky there. Yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, there's Bari Masetla. Bari Masetla, no, I've worked not very well. What an amazing interview that was. Um, and I was very fortunate to be presented with um, Anthony's book. Uh, shaking hands with Billy um, and uh, I've already started having a bit of a look at it um, seems amazing um, yeah and for the legacy viewers I'm sure you enjoyed that um, and until we meet again cheers